feature presentation. What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode 116 of the Untitled Movie Podcast. I am one of your hosts, Matt Rohrbeck, alongside, he's allergic to tomatoes, but he is tomato meter approved, Eric Marchin. Happy family day, you jackass. (laughs) <laughs> uh, I did go see Jackass today. Finally, it's been uh, I waited, what, two or three weeks, three weeks before I went to go see Jackass. But yeah, happy family day to you, too, Eric. I spent it with my family, the Jackass crew watching uh, genitals be mutilated. And God, destroyed. There's a lot of just dick trauma in the, in that movie. <laughs> it's just a lot of uh, it's funny as they get older. They're just like, well, we don't really need these anymore. <laughs> It's like, let's just let's just beat the hell out of each other's dicks, which they did before. I just felt like this was heavy on the on the dick humor and the dick trauma, which is when blood's funny. involved on the genitals. It's it's very oh disturbing. My God, that was that was painful. Yeah. But happy family day to you, too. How are you? I'm I'm good. I'm just happy that you finally got to hang out once more with Johnny Knoxville, Steve O, Wee Man, and all the uh, it was fun. All the favorites. Yeah. yeah, we we won't be doing like a full review. We just talked about it. We'll talk about it here. But um, again, there's not a lot to critique in the movie. I think you're either a fan of Jackass or or not. And Especially I once you like, get to four, right? Yeah, I mean, and it is. Uh, you know, there's some throwbacks to old stunts that they did. There's a lot of, again, like we said, uh, dick trauma. Um, it, it was genuinely very funny. It was just a great escape to the to the movies, like a, a perfect kind of Monday afternoon during family day. I just sat there with like six other people in the theater and 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 laughed our asses off, and really only gagged like once during the uh, the pig cum sequence. Oh. <laughs> Um, <laughs> what and, what part? Because uh, I I gagged a couple times with uh, Chris Pontius. Yeah, uh, when Pontius just gulps it, it was um, <laughs> it was the one thing where I'm like, oh, I can't, I can't. I'm drinking an iced coffee right now, and like I had some Reese's. Uh, I'm like, I don't know if eating during this movie I had a breakfast sandwich, but like luckily I I just crushed that before the movie started. But well, that scene was um, cut out of the movie Pig as well. Yeah, so. no, totally. But um, very funny. It's just uh, again. I think it was heavy on the like, let's punch each other in the dick or, or things like that. Um, PK Subban having a big, uh, you know, February of popping up in very random uh, things. Cause PK Subban was in Jackass during the cup test, uh, shooting yep. a slap shot at uh, Aaron McGahee and uh, contributing to the dick um, trauma. <laughs> and Eric, I don't know if you watched it yet, but he's also in the second episode of LOL Canada. La- last one laughing Canada PK Subban shows up and you see his bare ass at one point. Uh, so good for him, you know, NHL superstar PK Subban. Always like that guy, uh, except bring in the can con. Uh, but yeah, I had a good time with Jackass, man. Like it was just, it, it's funny 20 years after the original 20 plus years since the show first started airing. Right. And then, um, 10 There's years wild since boys Jackass too, 3. Right? Yeah. 10 years since Jackass three. And you can tell that they're all older and maybe they're not doing as insane stuff, but a lot of it is pretty insane. And, um, you know, it is maybe not derivative, but it is a lot of the similar stuff you saw in those first three movies. But um, we were talking before I even watched this and said that three is probably your favorite. And I would say, I think I'm in the same boat as you where three, it's the the toy story three of Jackass. Yeah. The three D cameras and that novelty, I think really works for that movie. And, um, but this is incredibly enjoyable. And I think if you like those three first three movies, you'll, you'll have a blast with this and you probably already, watched it but um had a great time with jackass just pure pure cinema (laughs) oh it's it truly is you know right up there with you know citizen kane and casablanca and the seven samurai it it really i i you know i'm I'm being glib but i do think it is a very entertaining visceral experience that there's a lot of creativity that goes oh totally and and yeah don't get enough credit for that like a lot of it i said is them punching each other in the dick but um there is a lot of like production uh, to the whole movie. Like these ridiculous things that they come up with are very, very funny and creative. And bringing in the new crew as well. Like I think my favorite person wasn't even a part of the new crew. It was Jasper's dad. Yeah. Dark shark. With, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it's so like his reactions are so amazing. Like yeah. I just was like, I would be that. 
I would have that exact same reaction to what you're going through. <laughs> oh, it's always great when they involve someone who's not necessarily like part of the crew who didn't necessarily sign up for it, but they're there in that day and they convince them to do something wild and ridiculous. And um, yeah, like 90% of the stuff I'm like, I would never, <laughs> never. Um, and where the third, camera yeah. goes as well. Yeah. Like I, the, the other thing I love watching as well is when you have, you know, people like Spike Jones or Jeff Tremaine, who's the director on this, or even uh, one of the cinematographers, Lance Bang, who always like gags, gags. <laughs> <laughs> Which is some of the best, like that is yeah. truly the, the most fun. Like, it's, it's the not- most fun bit that's been ongoing through all three movies is just him not being able to handle some of the more gross moments. And, and to your, like, we've talked about this before with Jackass where some of the best stuff isn't even kind of the, the spectacle of it. It's more so the small little things like paper cutting, you know, in between your fingers. I was or- kind of glad they didn't go that route this time. No, but like- there is a shot of, um, of a spider biting a nipple that they do this close and you're just like oh no <laughs> yeah, no that was horrible and you know me with bees so steve-o putting all the bees on his dick was Not like the bees! was horrifying <laughs> dude was horrifying <laughs> and like i just well the aftermath was terrible as well <laughs> like he just got stung a bunch of times and it was just like that's my nightmare and i'm like i fucking just getting stung once i hate and then to have bees on your crotch uh, no it's just <laughs> the worst but it, i do the if i did have a criticism it would be like they went to the dick stuff a lot <laughs> like yeah. and it's just like it's like, what else can we do to each other's dicks? And like, I, I think maybe <laughs> a little something else would have been, and I, I don't get me wrong. Still love the movie. Gave it a four out of five. I think it's great. Um, but more often than not, it was like, okay, what's a creative thing we can do to punish each other's dicks. And, um, which is funny. Um, but you know, I, I think that's where genital they, mutilation they usually is Just the funniest went there. Um, jackass everyone go see it or it should be on demand soon right yeah i think it's also getting a blu-ray release in like april so cool because i know that paramount's been doing that 45 day thing so i think scream is on march 1st and then jackass should be like maybe a week or two later so um eric what else is new man not much, Matt. I mean, we're we're at the beginning of the year. We're we're moving into spring coming up, which is exciting. So, you know, you've been watching things that you're either been catching up on for you know awards consideration because our uh, critics' choice deadline got moved, or you know you're just trying to watch some of the newer stuff. And you know, other than Scream, I would say most of it is eh, pretty middle of the road, to be polite. Um, not so much with uh, the latest Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which um, is terrible and deserve it. Like, it's one thing to say that a movie is bad based on the buzz. <laughs> Get it? Chainsaw buzz. <laughs> um, but it truly is a bad movie in the sense of that it didn't really know what to do other than copy Halloween, which is strange because Halloween is the film that copied Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And T- nightmare uh night, not night, nightmare uh night of the living dead and texas chainsaw massacre were the two movies that kind of ushered in this new wave of american independent horror which was very kind of you know focused on the exploitative nature of showing you something that was more graphic than yeah. what had come before because what had come before were a lot of you know, your classic universal monster movies. You had a lot of hammer films coming out around that time. So, you know, a guy in a monster suit running around and terrifying, you know, the cast of characters as they survive a situation or, or what have you. So, you you know, your Dracula's, your Frankenstein's monsters, Wolfman, that kind of thing. And so Night of the Living Dead, you know, comes out in the late sixties and is this like DIY, you know, movie that was made for like, ten dollars and became this huge um drive-in sensation um to the point where it made so much money but uh george romero didn't properly 
um, license the film and, and get the rights to it that it went into the public domain and so anybody can use it or Make watch a it. Living and, Dead movie, or and they have, and and that's yeah. and that's happened before. So he lost a lot of money with that. And then in the early seventies, Toby Hooper uh, and Kim Henkel, who wrote the script for Texas Chainsaw Massacre, were you know documentary kind of in documentary film school, kind of looking at at that sort of. Thing. And, and Toby Hooper specifically kind of was sick and tired of the horror movies that were coming out that were kind of just like your classic studio films. And so he wanted to make something that was like gross and weird and partly inspired by the Ed Gein murders, uh, which also inspired um, Norman Bates and Psycho. And so when you watch Texas Chainsaw Massacre, like even right from, you know, John Larroquette's voiceover narration to kind of the way that the, the film is shot, you can, you get a sense that it is very much like, you know, kind of trying to break the rules of what traditional movie making is and kind of just going for the most ugly and weird yeah. kind of shots it possibly can to the point where it can be also very um, esoteric uh, to like, kind of watch because it is hard to get through i think especially now but the scenes that make the most impact in that movie are the last 20 minutes or totally, so because yeah. you don't even get to kind of leatherface and and sort of the, the family the, yeah. The, yeah the gore until then and you're kind of stuck with characters that are you know i, I think marilyn a little great burns yeah yeah obnoxious franklin is pretty bad um but like marilyn burns i think is like you know iconic in terms of you know that final shot of the movie totally yeah um, that final shot is great yeah but this this film on i mean halloween also has a messy legacy when it comes oh, to most what's... horror franchises do yeah yeah but but texas chainsaw massacre doesn't have a legacy other than that first film being groundbreaking for the time mm -hmm. and so when you're copying halloween with doing what john carpenter did you know in in the late 70s and then you know going in and kind of making this one that connects in in 2018 the david gordon green yeah. film it's like okay well at least you can sort of you can take the music you can take you know the the pov aspect jamie lee curtis did become a movie star so you have that marilyn burns didn't she did work with toby hooper again on his second film um eaten alive which was marketed as an alligator um monster movie which was only like a small part of that so you got to think like okay what you're bringing into this there's there's not a lot there to go with other than leatherface himself and even with the texas chainsaw massacre sequels with the exception of part two all of them are basically soft reboots. The The second one, Toby Hooper came back to the franchise because a lot of the movies that he made post Poltergeist uh, and Funhouse to a lesser extent were failures. Like his, his passion project, Life Force, which was a sci-fi vampire movie uh, at MGM and United Artists, mm -hmm. almost bankrupt the studio again after Heaven's Gate. And so he had to go back to Texas Chainsaw Massacre because that's all he had. And so he but reluctantly... then he took like a satirical route with it. Exactly. Yeah. Instead of it being scary, it's, it's basically what like Gremlin's... It, you know, like Grimlin's I saw the Texas poster Chainsaw and Mass. it's like a Breakfast Club poster, right? And yeah, and it's like, making fun of yuppies. This? And yeah. so, like, it's basically what Joe Dante did with Gremlins too. Yeah, that Toby yeah. Hooper did. It was like, I don't want to come back and do this movie, but I and don't just do the I'm same not, thing over and again. Yeah, I don't have anything else I can do because he also got Invaders um, from Mars, which also didn't do that well. So he was just like, you know what? Fuck it. If I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do it my way, and I'm gonna make it, you know, completely bonkers and over the top and satirical. And it didn't do well, but it's kind of gotten more of a, a, a cult appreciation. It was also around the time that Dennis Hopper's career was coming back and Hopper was the lead in Texas Chainsaw Massacre too. So that was the same year that you had Hoosiers and Blue Velvet come out. And so that was a big sort of uh, marketing tool of that movie. The only other thing that Texas Chainsaw Massacre series is well known for is starting a lot of careers. So you have people like Matthew McConaughey and Renee Zellweger in part four of the Kim Henkel uh, movie, the, the Next Generation. It was one of McConaughey's first movies. It was Renee Zellweger's first film. Uh, the third Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie um, was the first one of the first movies that Viggo Mortensen was in after uh, Peter Weir's witness. And then more recently, uh, Alexandria Daddaro was in the 3d version, which is get him, cause 
terrible. So yeah, like the history of the chainsaw and and these movies. And they keep is, trying. They just keep trying. And they shouldn't. They should just leave. I guess because Leatherface is one. so iconic. I guess that they just keep holding on to that because I think anyone, even if you're not a fan of horror, know knows Texas Chainsaw and knows Leatherface. Like again, I. The, I'd never seen the original and, until this weekend, and I obviously knew a lot of it. I've seen some of the reboots. I saw that Michael Bay produced one with Jessica Biel. I saw the one with Alexandra Daddario. Um, I don't think I saw the one a couple years ago that was just called Leatherface. It's just like it's all over the place with these reboots for Texas Chainsaw. It's all the over the face. <laughs> where this one, I'm like, okay, they're doing the Halloween thing. It's a legacy sequel. Again, Scream just tackled all that and and kind of poked fun at that. But I'm like, okay, I'll go back and watch the original, and I'll watch this one and review it with you. Um, and I I I don't disagree with anything. And you're obviously much more knowledgeable when it comes to, you know, horror history and, and, and things like that. But uh, watching it for the first time in 2022, not being a huge horror guy, uh, like I like it enough uh, at, at times, but um, it just did absolutely nothing for me. But I understand the importance of it at the time. So I'm almost more appreciative of what it did for that genre and and that moving forward into the uh, mid to late seventies and into the, you know, into present, but I don't know. I just watching it, like you said, like characters were grading to me. It takes a long time to get going. And I don't mind that, like to build tension and atmosphere, the sweaty Texas setting and all this kind of stuff, like the, the farmhouse, I kind of like the, the setting. And even with the family at the end, I think the last 20 minutes are really good and interesting and, and weird and fucked up and strange. And the movie is very, very fucked up and, and and disturbing and i think it's effective in that way but um i could just never get invested into it and maybe wrong setting i was watching it in the afternoon on a sunday or whatever and i was just like the it, lord's day yeah it just did nothing for me to the point where i'm like i i kind of appreciate that last 20 minutes or so and um you can see how it's even inspired a lot of other stuff and and some people will get this but i played resident evil 7 recently and i feel like that movie that video game is taking a lot from texas chainsaw and in the setting and the family and and maybe more supernatural elements on the resident evil side but um you can see it's it's taking a lot from that movie and and so i can appreciate it for that but it just uh, it didn't do much for me and i'll probably still watch this new one just so uh, maybe I know you said it's bad and I don't really need to, but um... I mean, still, I, it's one of those things where we always talk about this, where it's like, you know, if we if we don't recommend something, it's not that we're saying don't see it yourself. We're just telling you how we felt about yeah. it. So if you are still curious about seeing something, whether it be on well, now I've invested or the, new the Texas time Chainsaw in, yeah. Massacre movie, you might as well give it a shot. And I invested just... the time in seeing the original. So I'm like, I might as well watch this one now. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and, and and again, like, there's a lot of stuff, like, I totally understand what you're basically saying is what Toby Hooper was saying in the 1970s with the, with the kind of horror movies that were being released then. Like, mm -hmm. it's like, they're doing nothing for me, I love the genre, I know that these kind of movies, these monster movies are influential, but let's do something different, mm -hmm. where the Texas Chainsaw Massacre for the time was something truly different. If I watched it in 1974, I'm sure I would have been like, holy yeah, fuck. Yeah, it played but, can, it got yeah. people's attention. Like, even someone like Ridley Scott has talked about, like, how the influence of that movie kind of inspired certain aesthetic um, aspects of Alien. And, yeah, like, and I see that. You kind of see that. Yeah. Totally. It's just now watching it, you know, this many years later... You know, I don't know. It's just it's more uh, an artifact now yeah, than it is totally. uh, like a like it's still it was definitely interesting. And, and yeah. I'm glad I went back and watched it. It's just it didn't do anything. Yeah. And you can me. tell like people even like, you know, like the obvious ones like the Eli Ross and the Rob Zombies of the world have all kind of taken a cue from oh, absolutely. that film. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, even if you don't love the movie, it, I think you can just be like, okay, you know what? I, I respect its place in the horror pantheon and what it did and kind of what it inspired. But maybe moving let's just forward. let it <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. Just let like it, let it die. Like... Don't milk this as a franchise when it's really not a franchise. Do like the one and done thing. But because Leatherface 
you know, Gunnar Hansen as Leatherface in the first movie was so iconic and also some of the behind the scenes kind of was turned into lore because it was like 16 hour shooting days. There's a scene in the film where um, one of the characters fingers is cut and the, the grandfather sucks on it. That's her real finger being sliced open. Mm. And they were trying to do it with like um, and it just a prosthetic. Right, but they just. No, 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 they couldn't get it. It couldn't yeah. work. And, and apparently by the time that they were like like hour 15 gunner hansen just took a real knife and sliced her finger open and yeah, no, it, like it got yeah and so obviously you know this was not a production that was on any union or studio sure. thing but yeah. but but that's kind of like the mythology it also kind of built around it as well that it was like a notorious production for kind of not yeah. really kind of going the traditional route and even with this new one like this new movie like a big part of the 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 selling point of it or or the the kind of the insidious nature of the production is that you had the original filmmakers leave the production a week after right. shooting and scrap what was there and reshoot a lot of it with uh david blue garcia kind of coming in and and fede alvarez who's a producer on the movie kind of you know taking over sort of Weird. more control and and a lot of the well the most of the movie is shot in eastern europe and it's not texas and yeah. the other thing that i thought was weird about this new one that it really doesn't iterate until almost the last scene of the movie is that it takes place in a not so distant future and there's one moment specifically huh. where I won't give it away, but what it does, it's like, oh, so this was all happening in like a futuristic world that you really kind of didn't set any Weird. kind of tone for or establish. Weird. Yeah. So. Okay. I'm curious. It's not good. Oh, I, I, but, I know, but it is, but... if you're, if, if you are morbidly curious or have watched the other movies in the franchise, you might as well dig in, but um, I, I guess, you know, spend time with the family. Um, sure. Yeah. Family day. There you go. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so yeah, but yeah. I'm glad you, I'm glad you gave it a shot and yeah. now you can I'm, see I have where that. some of those references come from. Absolutely. And that's something I I've tried to be better at and I'm glad I'm going back and watching some things that have just totally whiffed on me. Um, I continued the Rohrbeck International Film Festival this past weekend. So um, if you guys missed that episode, Nevis made me a wonderful um, fake film festival called the Rohrbeck International Film Festival, which I'm now turning into a real thing where uh, friends and family programmed me movies that they either I hadn't seen or they think that I hadn't seen or something that was just connected uh, to us or, or the person that was programming it. Uh, so last weekend I watched Ronin, which was programmed by Nevis. I uh, had a good time watching that. Uh, this past weekend we watched uh, Adventures in Babysitting, which was programmed by uh, our friend Jackie. Um, so <laughs> Derek, I, I turned this on. I'm like, oh, great. It's streaming on Disney+. Plus. <clears throat> I totally forgot this was one of the movies in that big controversy when Disney Plus first launched where they edited the shit out of it and it was the TV version of it. Yeah, and especially I'm like, with like, don't fuck with the babysitter. Yeah, and line. I'm like, and they, they edit a lot of the movie and I'm sitting there and it started and I'm like, oh, should I rent it for $5? And I'm like, I don't want to rent it for $5. And I'm like, I should rent it for $5 on Apple. But then I was like, we were in the other room and my Apple TV wasn't set up there. And I'm very particular of where I rent my movies and shit for quality purposes. And like everything on Disney Plus, I'm like, the quality is good, but I'm watching the weird TV version. And I'm like, you know what? I'll just Google the scenes after uh, to see how much better it is with some of the swearing and, and stuff in it. And I think it does hurt the movie where it, it cuts some of the edge that the movie has. Uh, this was my first time watching it and uh, I had a blast with it though. Like it, again, it is that I was saying to Nevis, like I just, it, same with Ronin, which is obviously late nineties where this is late eighties, but like um, this is that kind of fun kind of weird movie that you don't, I feel like we don't get much anymore, but like, I don't know. I just love the vibe of the movie. It's kind of bizarre, but um, just this one night of them in this happenstance getting in the most ridiculous situations and the most ridiculous characters and, and, and things happening over and over, over again that I actually had 
uh, a really good time with it. And um, where is that fine line of being like a kid's movie? And you can see Disney's trying to make it more of a kid's movie by being on Disney Plus. But it is that cool kind of kid's movie that you would have watched when you were like a little bit older. And then because it said fuck twice and like said shit and asshole and stuff like that. Um, that it has a little bit of an edge to it and being, I think it's Chris Columbus's first movie, right? Directly. It's one of his first yeah. films. And then uh, um, Deborah Hill, who produced Halloween is yeah. a producer on this. And um, yeah, like it's, it's, it's one of those movies where like it's in that genre of, you know, it happened one night and all yeah. these kind of, you know, shenanigans over the that course. That are totally unbelievable, but a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. And how the characters kind of get in over their heads and it becomes worse to the point where it's like, okay, they go from, you know, babysitting to being a part of this uh, uh, car hijacking yeah. sort of conspiracy. And um, yeah, it's been a while since I've watched it, but like, I remember the last time I did see it, the thing that I laughed at the most or thought about the most is that um because it's also one of bradley whitford's first films. yes and whitford plays... and vincent uh vincent D'Onofrio, D'Onofrio as thor which yeah. i always reference yeah. every time like um you know s- thor con- content comes out. it's like yeah i mean King they King. dropped the ball there that you know vincent D'Onofrio should have played thor or a variant um, of thor at some point that would be a fun exactly thing. And, yeah. and maybe there's still the possibility of that but um the bradley whitford but he thing should be always... dressed like this with the trucker cap and <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the Bradley Whitford thing is kind of interesting because like you always think like the Elizabeth Shue character is so likable and so nice, but also very smart. It's like, mm-hmm. why was she dating that guy in the first Where place? Where he just seems like an asshole, but maybe he was so good. He's at an ass man. A, yeah. Um, and it didn't even, I was sitting there and it took me, I was like so delayed in that first sequence where I'm like halfway through that sequence. I was like, is that Bradley Whitford? <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah, it is. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, okay. Cause this movie's what? It's 30 plus years old, right? Like 30, yeah, it's five like years old, 80, 86, um, 87. 87. So 35 yeah. years old, which is wild. And, um, and then, so I got that point and Nevis was like, oh, you didn't re- that took you that long. I was like, yeah, but then she didn't realize that was Vincent D'Onofrio. So I got her. Cause like right away I was like, this is Vincent D'Onofrio. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. uh, so some great MCU content, you know? And Elizabeth Shue, I mean, is it, she's it, fantastic. Uh, yeah, and like, like it, it was like a star making performance yeah. for her that when she got an Oscar nomination for leaving Las Vegas for, you know, alongside Nick Cage, the, the Mike Figs. Yeah, film, it was kind of considered like, oh, you know, the, the star of this, you know, cute kids movie now is doing and like, Karate Kid. you know, yeah, and doing and, 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 and the Back to the Future films is like doing yeah. this like kind of like edgier kind of darker material now and has grown up. So, um, but yeah, like that was an introduction to a lot of people of how, you know, talented she was. And uh, it's a solid little fun movie. It is. One thing I will say for criticism is that a lot of the, uh, people that they bump into that are scary to them are all people of color. (laughs) And like, they're just four, like, you know, suburban white kids, um, that, that felt like a little icky to me as it kept going, where it's just like, you know, the people at the chop shop or the people on the subway or everyone that they bumped into had to be, you know, um, a person of color that it, it almost did feel intentional and weird. And I get that it's the late eighties. It's a different time, but, um, it's something now watching in 2022 that you're like, okay, not great. <laughs> right. Um, so just to be completely transparent of like, I, I think it's a fun movie, but I, I do think that it, it is of its time a little bit. Um, and well, yeah, it's also the fear of, 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 you know, white suburbia. Going sure. Into the that city, might be right? intentional too. Right. Like, but I know maybe, what you're but, saying where like yeah. all the characters, except for the one kind of guy who's in charge of everything, who just looks terrifying in general. Yes. yes um, he looks terrifying. Uh, is, is, is the one, the one white guy that's, of course he's sinister. the guy in charge, right? Like it's yeah. just, it, that's the kind of stuff that is just not super great, but, um, I think the movie does have an edge to it that is unfortunately lost on Disney plus. And I thought that because well, kids movies in general, right? Yeah. And it kind of feels that that's gone completely now where everything is so safe. And, um, I thought because we have star that they might've put the normal version up, but obviously they just have the one version on both American and Canadian Disney plus. So I don't suggest watching it on Disney plus, uh, so try to seek out the Blu-ray or um, rent it on, you know, Apple or if you want to rent it digitally. 
Um, cause I do, I went through and I watched the don't fuck with the babysitter line. Um, some of the other lines, the one thing that I'm kind of glad that they cut out that I feel like maybe they should continue is when the little girl calls, uh, the guy a gay slur and I'm right. like, ah, okay, maybe that one's a good one to maybe cut out. Um, but well, again, I, no, I think that they should leave it in because totally. again, you need to, you need to know keep it. And yeah. I think you need to know that that's what they wrote into the movie as like a funny thing back then, right? Yeah. Like, Cause the 80s were full of that. I mean, yeah, Bill and, and totally Ted, we've agree. talked about that yes. a lot as well. So. I, I'm sort of being facetious, but like, it's just, it, it, I agree with you that it should be in there for you, for it to be jarring for this little girl to be like, he called you this. And then you go, Whoa, time out. Jesus. Um, so they cut that out. And I think there's a, uh, another line that's pretty, dark that they cut out too but um had a good time with the movie so i like when they go to the hospital after the one kid gets the knife in his tone it's like you're just gonna need one stitch it's like tell them something worse it's like he's dead (laughs) yes it's hilarious there's a lot of great stuff in that movie and uh again it i I look to your point like yeah i feel like it's either a kid's movie or an adult and i get like you know the big blockbuster stuff has an edge to it and can be violent and um and things like that without showing blood but like this really felt like a you know this would have felt like a kids movie i felt like maybe i wasn't supposed to be watching if i was like 7 8 years old right and yeah. like you'd feel though, more grown up watching it yeah a little bit like it is that middle ground between like a g rated movie and i know it's a pg rated movie but like you know an r rated movie between pg and r or whatever like i think that's a, a fun spot to be in right um, which is also bizarre because part of like like one of the subplots is that uh there's this playboy centerfold that kind of looks, looks like, like and elizabeth it is a shoe li- and it is her <laughs> yeah but, but but like in terms of like the for, character yeah. not yeah like in real life it was her but like not in like the movie no. universe and like the funny thing is it's like wait this is a kid's movie and you keep going to this is like a reference because of the writing that's on it and like and that's know, what i mean by like them. it is that it's like i would consider it like not a movie for adults but it's also not a kid's movie. So it is yeah. like it, is, but it is a kid's movie, but you could get away with some of that stuff, which is, I guess why touchstone released it back in the day and not Disney. Right. Even though yeah. it's technically a Disney movie, it's, um, it's a gr- it's a film for adults that grew up with it sure. as kids. Like yeah. I still have a strong affection for it, even though to your point, there are problematic aspects of it. But like, I think if there's a generation of kids that grew up with it in, you know, the late eighties into the nineties, watching it, on cable when it would pop up you know now as an adult if you were to watch it and having seen it as 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 a child i think you would be you'd have more tolerance towards it than say like if you were just an adult watching it for some reason i Mm -hmm. i don't know why like maybe you're an elizabeth shoe completist or something and you just throw this on you'd be like (laughs) This or it's programmed sucks. in a in a fake film festival that your yeah. uh, fiance put together. But you really enjoyed it. Uh, I thought it was a great pick, Jackie. Thank you. Um, I can't wait to continue this. I don't know what I'll – maybe I'll watch yours next, Eric. Hard maybe. target, baby. Yeah. I, I, I'm just going through randomly, and I'm going to start ranking them on Letterboxd. I don't know where I would put Ronin versus – adventures in babysitting (laughs) it's such a weird comparison (laughs) like i i will say that i both have cars yeah um yeah and i think i liked them both for different reasons i gave them both a three a three and a half um and i have issues with both for different reasons so i don't know I'll, i'll see where i rank them i think i had more fun with babysitting though so that might edge out ronin by a little right. bit um well, it, but I, ronin, had, I liked ronin a lot though, so. ronin in comparison to adventures in babysitting is very self-serious where yeah. like if you just want something that's kind of purely entertainment and enjoyable and isn't kind of maybe referencing as much when it comes to the history of cinema the way that ronin does with mm-hmm. the car chase sequences then yeah well i, I think they're both really fun movies though. yeah i think like they're both like Ronin is one of those films where it truly is like, this is this director's last big hurrah before, you know, basically closing down and, 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 and kind of retiring slash passing away. And so mm-hmm. like, you can see that like the last little bit of joy that he had, cause he kind of struggled there, John Frankenheimer, um, 
you know, with the last couple things he did with it, you know, coming on to to basically retool and work on the island of Dr. Monroe and then Reindeer Games as well were two movies that were just kind of like they had so many problems in the production aspects of it. And, and he was a part of those problems. But then Ronan is this weird movie where it's like, oh, this, the guy that directed the train is back you know the guy that 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 made all these great kind of you know weird thrillers from the 60s like the mandarin candidate and seconds is kind of having fun again and kind of like his last hurrah so Mm. you can appreciate it on just that level too yeah absolutely um the other thing i've been watching i've been prepping for a little movie called the batman by not watching batman movies but by watching matt reeves movies so i watched the entire even though i i know he didn't do the first one but i watched the entire planet of the apes uh reboot trilogy um this past week um he, obviously matt reeves stepped in to do dawn and war where rise was directed by rupert wyatt but um it's the same thing as 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 doug lyman directing the first born movie and then paul greengrass kind of taking over and kind of mm-hmm. making it his own that more people yeah. are like it's greengrass than it is like doug lyman i will give rupert wyatt some credit though because i do think and i think you're on the same page eric where that first like rise of the planet of the apes i think is a pretty solid little like first installment and i think that trilogy as a whole is I know it made good money and and it was very well received critically, but I I still feel like it's one of those underrated movie trilogies because I just feel like it is one of the best representations of how to do a modern reboot of a classic franchise. Like I I'm so incredibly impressed with all three of those movies and like um, both Matt Reeves movies, I think are, and it just makes me so fucking excited for the Batman because like those movies on paper should not work like any of them, like, and even seeing trailers or scenes out of context or, or if you're not a fan of those movies or know, know of them and know the quality that you might go like, what the fuck a monkey on a horse with machine guns? Like, or like, do you think you'll feel real emotion and all this kind of stuff? But the movies, all three of those movies, I feel like say so much, about so many different things and are so more elevated than you would expect them to be for just silly movies about like apes taking over the world that like, there's so much more to them than that. And I feel like that those three movies are a near perfect, like blockbuster movie trilogy that has actual incredible filmmaking, cinematography, music performances. And then they're just, engaging and fun at times but then like emotional at other times and uh, i'm just so thoroughly impressed and i i know i loved them all when i saw them in theaters and but i think watching them back to back to back um caesar's arc throughout those three movies and just where those movies go i think are, are so excellent and they're all so different from one another too like each one has a different vibe and a different genre kind of that they're tackling and um and a completely different cast. And I think we haven't gotten a trilogy like that um, since. And, and I just, I'm so pumped for the Batman after watching those three. Cause like, you can see some of that in, I mean, even let me in, which I haven't rewatched. And then into the trailers for the Batman, you can see some of the similar cinematography, even though he's working with Greg Frazier on, on Batman, which is different cinematographer than he used on the apes movies. But uh, I, I love those movies, man. I think you're in the same boat too. Yeah, I I really do like um, all three of the films and and Matt Reeves, you know, two films kind of feel like this additional step up and kind of what define the franchise as a whole. But I think what I also love about Caesar's arc and what he did with that character in this particular franchise is he made a biblical allegory to Moses leading the Israelites to the promised land the way that's only one like i that's one interpretation i think there's many oh, yeah no no th- th- there yeah. totally is but like the idea that you know the, the, this this one character becomes the leader and is yeah. looking for a place for his followers and disciples to find you know peace and sanctuary and like that kind of being also just an interesting set up for where it ends because the where it ends is where the first planet of the apes movie begins basically and Mm -hmm. and like that is kind of fascinating as well because origin trilogy yeah 
because even though there hasn't been another Planet of the Apes movie since War of the Planet of the Apes, the way that they set it up, it's like, okay, well, you know, we'll we'll leave it open. But also you could just look at this as, you know, connective tissue to, to the original, original films, yeah. you know, and, and, and it's respectful in that way. And I, and I really uh, do like those movies and, and yeah, like they are weirdly underrated as a franchise as a whole, like all three of them did well and were critically acclaimed to certain degrees. And, and, and I think most people would agree that Andy Serkis's performance, um, you know, was a, a driving factor in, in all of that. But yeah, it, it's, it's weird how that series doesn't get the credit it necessarily deserves. And as much as I love the original version and some of the, the sequels, um, that came afterwards, I think Ronnie McDowell was amazing in it. And, and that first movie specifically, um is is fantastic and and even the references in pulp culture like uh the troy mcclure yeah. on the stage version dr zayas dr zayas oh i love um, that episode of the simpsons man. oh it's so good um you know like there it's just a it's just a fascinating franchise in general because it's like when you think about like again we know talking about texas chainsaw massacre talking about you know like a world dominated by like eight people and you're just like again there's amazing allegories there oh and, absolutely um you know the tim burton one sucks sorry uh it's bad Fucking uh, Mark but, Wahlberg. <laughs> but what but, are all these apes doing here but it's just really interesting that it's like there was a time Damn, where apes? where these ideas could be pitched yeah and they would get made and you know, Planet of the Apes was before Star Wars too, which is again very interesting. And I know, like someone like your dad is a huge yeah. fan of these movies, and not everybody is a big sci-fi fan. And but he's not it, at all. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's interesting, you know, like who it kind of like it hooks, and and, and maybe uh, it's because yeah. he saw it as a kid, and so that's why he can kind of buy into this. But he never got into Star Wars, but he did like Planet of the Apes, right? So it's yeah. It is interesting. And like, he loves this trilogy as well to the point I brought him to the press screening of war. And I remember that just being a, a really fun experience with my dad and um, him getting to see it before it came out. And it's just such a wonderful movie. And and yeah, like I said, like each movie has its own vibe to it. I, I think Dawn is probably my favorite. And um, I just think that movie fucking rips at every level. Like it's just so fun and just, uh, and intense and just Gary Oldman is great. And like, I mean, Jason Clark is great and Cody Smith McPhee and Carrie Russell kind of underused, but still great. Cause it's Carrie Russell and she's amazing. And like, uh, but then the third movie being like, yeah, that kind of war kind of movie and, and Woody Harrelson being this just nasty piece of shit and just, um, um, and yeah, just it, how it just lets those movies live and let you live with the apes with the very minimal dialogue and all sign language. And just Michael Giacchino's score is like, uh, just absolutely. You can, I, I tweeted this at someone cause I tweeted out like how many franchises that guy's been a part of. And we talked about him during um, a review recently. I forget for Spider-Man and, um, and he's just been doing everything and you can kind of really tell when he's super invested in something or if he's working with like one of his close friends or, or, or something like that. Cause I feel like, you know, that's when you get top tier Giacchino or then you get kind of some other ones that just are like, all right, let's, I let, I need to buy a, a, another car or something. Right. Uh, Giacchino. And <laughs> Daddy like, needs a new house. Yeah, uh, yeah. Something like that where um, I think his scores for both Dawn and war are absolutely fantastic. And yeah, Andy circus, which I remember the conversation at the time where people who were fans of those movies were like, you should get an Oscar nomination and it should be like the first you know, fully CG character, fully motion you know, capture, motion yeah. capture performance uh, to get a uh, Oscar nomination. And unfortunately that did not happen, but um, he is, he's absolutely phenomenal in those movies and, and just, uh, just everyone's arc, like Koba's arc throughout it and Caesar's relationship with Koba. And like uh, Maurice is just such a wonderful character throughout all three of those movies. You just love that guy. And, um, and just even like rocket and you have all these like arcs and you know, these individual apes. And then to your point of like the, the little nods to where the franchise is going with Caesar's son being Cornelius and just like, um, all that stuff where to your point, like Disney could, and I think they did announce that they are doing uh, another one that, um, uh, Rick Jaffa and is it Amanda, what's her name? The writers of the original movie and, and stuff like that are coming back and. And they're doing another one. So maybe 
they'll finally adapt that first movie or or who knows right like and they said it will continue caesar's legacy or whatever which you assume it'll just pick up when cornelius is a, a bit older right and um and that you're a bit further into the future and they could easily adapt that first movie with the i guess you ruin the twist with at troy this mcclure point. yeah yeah <laughs> i guess you don't do the twist at the end but i mean the twist can still be there for the characters if if you do go the route of the astronauts that have been in cryo sleep or whatever and crash back on earth and you or you know. see it from the point of view of the apes instead yeah. of the Charlton. Because maybe it's character. been so many years where they haven't seen a human and, and yeah, people crash land. And I don't know what the story there would be, but um, I guess you could just adapt that first movie and, and do something similar. But um, I, I hope it continues. Uh, you know, you do worry that, you know, bring in new, uh, even if you're bringing back the writers, like depending on who you attach to the, these movies as a director and, and, and stuff like that. But um I'd be so down for it to continue because I, I I think those movies are awesome. Yeah, as long as the quality of whoever is the the director um, behind it, because I do think it is a director forward um, blockbuster yeah. um, series. Because you can really tell that Matt Reeves, you know, you look at Let Me In and some of the the shot choices he makes in that movie and how they kind of follow into. Um, you know, his he loves like a static well. camera in a rotating, like in a car crash, or that yeah, three, that three sixty shot on the tank is absolutely fucking awesome in in Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. And there's another sequence with Jason Clark, a one shot as he's running through uh, his like uh, home area um, while all the apes are attacking, and it, it's it just absolutely rips. It's so so good. Yeah, so that's kind of where, like, I think, you know, going in to see the Batman where that's the most excitement. Because even though I've I've liked everything I've seen, a lot of it still does feel like it's in the shadow of Christopher Nolan's films, which now have had about, what, tw- uh, 10 years from The Dark Knight Rises mm-hmm. to kind of breathe a little bit in terms of um, Batman content. But... Um, we got Affleck, but <laughs> but yeah, but but we I mean, never like, got a Batman movie. He was yes, always a, a solo character. Batman yeah. trilogy again, or or, or a series or even, of films because yeah. this is assumed to be another trilogy. Um, so I I think like that's something where like throughout this movie, through throughout the Batman, we'll hopefully see those tricks of the trade that Matt Reeves brings, you know, to the table, and already with Giacchino's score, you know, some of it being released online it already does have a distinct quality to it that kind of feels exciting again, because, you know, as much as I love Batman, there is, you know, a certain amount of, of, uh, you know, refreshing a character and rebooting a character over and over again to the point where it's like, okay, maybe we should give this more time to breathe than just 10 years, because even though it has been 10 years, the Nolan sort of aspect of the origin story, the reboot, still feels like it weighs heavy not only on the batman franchise but superhero franchises and action franchises in general and so it's hard to kind of get away from that and and i think that that'll be interesting to see what the batman does differently compared to what nolan's films did yeah and everything we've heard of it being more of a, a detective story and obviously seeming like it's going to have a lot of incredible action too but um three hours long so um which gives it a lot of time to kind of do those things so i'm so looking forward to it dude so um we will have a review for the batman next monday which we can say they know people the embargo is on the 28th so uh, we haven't seen it yet but um we will have a review for you guys next monday so one week from today uh for the batman and i know eric and i are very very excited and and uh, yeah matt reeves i think one of my favorite working uh filmmakers at least when it comes to the big hollywood studio system like he's just found a way and i know he hasn't has he done anything since war no No, right no because he was he literally got the the batman gig right after as as the war was doing the press junket stuff yeah and people kept asking him questions about like oh how does the batman compare to or how does batman compare to it just feels like i guess it's five years ago so it's not that long like i thought war was you again these movies just kind of go under the radar like i thought they were further away from us than they were but um i'm just i'm pretty pumped so um but he does take time because even after even before um 
Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, like Let Let Me In was the last thing that he directed, yeah. right? So and that was and that was twenty eleven for that too, so, right? Like yeah. he does select something and he gives it his all, and and we've talked about it. Like why I also love Matt Reeves because it just seems like he just gives a shit, and there's not that element of like he's doing anything because it's you know a job or he has to do something like you know him going and tweeting and putting things on vimeo is like him getting permission from warner brothers to put a 4k version out because he knows their marketing team either won't or maybe it's part of the marketing because that's his thing is is that kind of stuff but um it just seems like you know he's very meticulous and really kind of gives a shit so uh, i cannot wait uh to see this movie and and matt reeves he gives a shit. And again, Vote. I'm kind of with you where, you know, Batman, we're so oversaturated with Batman stuff over the last, you know, couple decades, uh, 30 years. But, um, you know, every version of Batman, I feel like stands on its own to, for better or for worse. Like, and none of them feel, you know, you can joke about, are we going to see Martha and, and, and Thomas get shot again? Like all this kind of stuff. Like, and I'm sure there'll be some sort of flashback. Maybe we won't exactly see it, but you're going to see some of that where, you know, Spider-Man, same thing where you're seeing the same shit over and over and How over. How many and over times again. does Uncle Ben, ben need to die. die? How many times does Martha need to die? Like, um, to the point where it's a, a comical plot point in, in Batman V Superman. But, um, yeah, but each one I think stands on its own for being something completely different. So I, I'm curious to see. This feels the most Nolan esque, obviously, with the kind of more grounded tone and and seems to be dark and disturbing and, and things like that. But and taking feels... influence from other Fincher movies, and, yeah, like the way seven. that Nolan like talked about like Michael Mann movies mm-hmm. being a major inspiration for his trilogy. So mm-hmm. so um it still feels very comic booky though too and yeah go listen to those if you don't want to spoil anything don't go listen to those pieces of music but giacchino has released uh the batman theme the riddler theme and the catwoman theme uh which you guys can go listen to and all feel completely different like catwoman's got like a jazzy feel and like um the batman theme had more emotion in it than i was expecting and the riddler theme was more bombastic than i was expecting um, I'm sure we'll get the penguin um, one dropping this week, um, but I'm uh, God, I'm pumped. So can't wait. Um, yeah. I mean, I think we should actually segue from the Batman yeah. to Peacemaker and yeah. talk about our, our thoughts uh, about uh, James Gunn's series as a whole. Yeah, I've seen it all. Um, so, Eric, we both watched the complete uh, first season of Peacemaker um i'll start with you how'd you feel about this season as a whole because i know you um have a diff you started off kind of tepid on it and then it kind of became you know yeah i I think around episode four or five is where it started to click and it became the grower uh not a shower uh series as it was destined to become and it really does feel like a wonderful companion piece to super in a lot of ways. I, I, I think sometimes it can be a little much when it comes to reminding you that this is, you know, an R rated series an R rated superhero show with, you know, the, the dropping of the F bomb or, you know, kind of being vulgar for vulgar sake. I, I don't have anything against that. I just think that like, sometimes when you're doing it kind of, it loses its impact if you completely do it all the time. But as the show progressed and as we kind of got to know the characters and sort of the dynamics between sort of, you know, not the, and this is the other thing I actually really liked about it is that there's not a lot of world building. It kind of feels like it's more focused on the characters than it is plot per se. Like the plot of this alien invasion going on is almost secondary to. And it's very of, straightforward, but yeah. Yeah. Going to sort of like the dysfunctional kind of unit. That's kind of this, you know, group of, of, of colleagues kind of forced mm-hmm. together and kind of the payoffs of certain jokes becoming more sincere the or sad. Great. Yeah. It, it all kind of really came together in a way that felt earned by the time you got to that final episode. And obviously the opening credit sequence is a total banger and it works so well in each episode and you won't want to, you know, race through it, but also the song itself kind of gets in your head. It becomes, you know, this earworm. Um, Yeah. I I just think it's one of those shows. I, I, I think when, when gun 
let someone like Jody Hill come in to direct an episode. That's where I felt like, oh, okay, like we can bring in these other really interesting, weird, sometimes um, uh, very aggressive filmmakers who are known for doing works that are polarizing. Like Jody Hill, like Observe and Report feels akin to what, peacemaker what chris smith is and yeah. like it, it's a perfect fit for in terms of somebody directing an episode of that and yeah. so yeah it maybe it doesn't have you know a, a a great episode in the way that like in the book of boba fett the one that bryce dallas howard directed was phenomenal and kind of felt like, like a it standout really... episode from the rest but it it's yeah. so consistent or or like you said it kind of grew to this ultimate uh, climax that i think i'm totally in agreement that i think it's the best thing the dc that's come out of the DCEU. I think it's one of the best things James Gunn has done. And I feel like it's the perfect thing to show people that superhero shows can work. And especially weird ones about characters you don't know or didn't care about, or even saw in a movie and were a piece of shit in there where you're like, I don't fucking like this guy. Why would I want to watch a series about him? How is he going to be redeeming? And then by the end of it, you're tearing up when an Eagle hugs him and like, or that die beard moment that I'm mentioning, or just even if the plot was simple with the butterflies, like where that goes was unexpected and, and how, you know, Chris deals with them as he's finding himself and try to find a better version of himself. And like, um, even though he's still, you know, still peacemaker and still doing the things that, and how that takes a toll on a character, especially a character that you, you never would have gotten that if it wasn't for a TV show about them, right? Like you don't have enough time in a movie to spend with a character in an ensemble cast to know much about him or even want to know much about him. So it's just, I think the perfect example of like that can work. And I've liked it even more than most of the Marvel stuff. And you guys know how much I'm a, like an MCU fanboy and like, um, and how the DC stuff wasn't really working for me, but there's like a moment in this episode and I'm not going to spoil it, but like, I'm surprised at how I popped for it. I was like, Oh shit. <laughs> and I was like, like, I don't care at all about these people, but like, this was cool that they did that and were able to get those people. And like, um, and, and when you talk about world building, like, yeah, I think it keeps it pretty, you know, tight onto that group of characters. And it feels like it is in that world of the suicide squad, but then the world building that James Gunn did for the DCEU and really hammering home that now this is that same world that you saw in Batman V Superman and man of steel and, um, you know, Aquaman and, and all of these movies that is like, it doesn't make sense that it's in that world, but he just, he commits to it and makes you kind of believe by the end of it, that this is this ridiculous world that these people live in. And this is all normal. So when they're talking about Batmite or green arrow or all these characters that hadn't shown up in the DCEU, but makes it feel like this bigger universe or bigger world that we never really got to see. And I'm surprised that, you know, uh, Warner brothers in DC is kind of at that point. And we talk about it, that they're at a good point where they're just like, yeah, fuck it. Just do whatever you want. <laughs> like we're probably going to reset this shit with the flash anyway. So it's like, just do whatever you want. It, it will make it make sense. And like continuity is like not a huge deal. And they'll kind of, you know, which I think is the opposite side of Marvel, right? Where continuity is everything. Everything needs to be, you know, very meticulously planned. And when there are plot holes or something that doesn't work in one movie or the other, or you have to include this in, in this movie because it's setting up this thing three movies from now. Like that's what comic books got in, kind of in trouble with because like the content, it got so bogged down in continuity. People were like, shit can i jump in or do i need this like 20 years of history like what's this tied to what's this not tied to and he did a good job of going yeah it's it's in this universe but who gives a shit is essentially their their stance right now is like some of it yeah it is it isn't who who cares we might have fun with it in this series it might take it seriously in this one it might we might reference it here here it might feel like it's not so like i like that and i love the mcu for being bogged down in continuity and i think you'll either love it or hate it for that um and i think the further we go on without you know eventually they're gonna have to reset and we're gonna get reboots of all these characters and then that'll be interesting where it'll be in universe but they're all reboots which are already kind of getting to so um anyways i love it i thought john cena best work of his career i kind of shit on that guy 
uh, a little bit for his dramatic chops in a lot of movies. And I also thought he only worked in like comedic kind of silly roles where I feel like this was a great balance of both the comedic and he also crushed some of those dramatic moments. And I feel like uh, it played to his strengths, which we've talked about, but uh, there are some moments where I'm like, damn, John Cena's good actor. I'm like, good for him. And the whole cast is great. And yeah, the payoffs for a lot of the stuff throughout the season, they slow played a lot of stuff. And then for it to come back and be as impactful as it was, like I'm amazed at how much emotion I tweeted this too, but how much emotion James Gunn can put into something that seems so silly or something that we don't care about or, or things like that. So yeah, I thought he crushed it and I'm glad it's coming back for season two. Yeah, same. And, 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 to, and like, again, like it's one of those things where he gets so much mileage out of a CGI character that you become sort of completely bonded with in the same way that in this series, Chris is with Eagly. Yeah. Um, or he's takes, just, it's like one of his trademarks now. <laughs> yeah. Or, or takes a character that should be on paper as obnoxious as Deadpool and makes him somewhat redeemable, or at least you can, empathize with him to a certain extent when he's up against somebody that's even worse you know and and and, um you know it is very silly at times it is very goofy it's gory in that kind of trauma manner that gun kind of you know has a background in and and none of that is taken away but it does feel like it needed a few episodes to kind of really kind of find its footing and then run from there and once it got going it really didn't stop and yeah cena is really really good in sort of you know very emotional kind of low-key moments but also can kind of you know bring the big kind of over the top broad comedy of playing somebody that's quote unquote all American Mm -hmm. um in that way and so you know you, you get a nice balance of of his greatest kind of you know strengths in those scenes and and kind of coming together in that final episode so well that you do want to see you know maybe a little bit more of where this character's story could go and that's you know why i think season two will be something worth checking out in the next year or so when when you know it 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 gets released so it'll be exciting to see how or what that does and and it also does feel separate enough where like the way that they talk about these other comic book characters almost sounds like the way that, you know, people have pop culture references in general. So you can kind of just like look at it. It's like, oh, it's like guys from like a Kevin Smith movie talking about Batmite mm-hmm. instead of, you know, like um, necessarily being like, oh, well, everything is all interconnected. And this is, you know, part of the, the DCEU, which yeah. it is. But at the same time again like it's not going to be in the same kind of realm as the the suicide squad the movie itself or um you know any of the upcoming uh films whether they be the new aquaman movie or the flash or uh shazam 2 it's it's its own weird little thing that kind of is you know a pocket in this world that i think actually really works to its its benefit Mm -hmm. and it just makes all this wild shit that's happening believable where you're not going how would that why is that character reacting that way or or whatever it's just no that's how this world is so you kind of just buy into that um it's great if you guys haven't checked it out you really should even if you haven't been a fan of the dceu or uh i would highly suggest going back and watching guns suicide squad before or the suicide squad my bad um before you have to be specific with that one (laughs) because i think it does call back to like how he was in that movie and i think you know the face turn um after the heel turn in that movie i think like it's it was immediate but it it just it felt very believable and and earned um because they do cut back to a couple moments from the suicide squad quite frequently well Um, in the first episode the the recap is the is the movie right i guess yeah Yeah. so you could just jump into the first episode and they're going to kind of give you the cliff notes but um it's worth watching as well um cool uh eric anything else you watch that you want to talk about or yeah i'll quickly just recommend this because scream factory sent me a, a a copy of it it will be available i mean I'm, I'm it'll be available as uh on tuesday uh this week we're recording on on the monday um but a film that's kind of been in demand for quite some time from a lot of 
uh, horror fans and creature feature uh, aficionados uh, is 1980s Alligator, directed by Louis Teague, who would go on to direct uh, two Stephen King uh, adaptations, Cujo and uh, Cat's Eye. Uh, Alligator is kind of best known as being this kind of weird riff on jaws but what if the creature was out and about in new york city and it stars robert uh uh, forrester as a man that is um this beat cop who's trailing this gator uh who at first is kind of assumed to be a serial killer um but then later on is uh found out to be this creature that was flushed down the toilet and is now terrorizing uh people far and wide it's the first time it's ever been out on uh blu-ray it has a it's being released as a blu-ray 4k combo so um the 4k edition uh this film has never looked better it still retains a lot of that kind of grimy grittiness that the original uh sort of you know film print and vhs print had if you or if you watch it on vhs or if you watch the film version of it um i remember talking to quentin tarantino uh about it specifically when i was in la um humble brag well the reason why i bring it up because they they had a a film print of it that they were playing at the new New beverly and when i was talking to tarantino about it he said that he based max cherry on uh, Robert Forrester's character from Alligator of what if this character from Alligator became a bail bondsman in Jackie Brown and so you know talking to him about that was a lot of fun and then on the the 4k blu-ray combo pack there's a just a delightful little interview with Brian Cranston who was a PA on this movie in 1980. And it goes to show you one, how much fun he had making that movie or or just being on set of that film. And two, like that they were able to get him to do this little interview and talk about like the making of this movie and from his perspective and just kind of being, you know, a first timer kind of getting his, you know, kind of feet wet and and working on something like this. So like, even that is just a lot of fun. Um, So it's, it's, it, the movie itself is, is, is okay. It's, it's a very, by today's standards, um, slow paced creature feature that takes a lot of time. And there's not a lot with the gator itself because again, they can't, they don't have like you know the animatronics and things that can really make it work. So how's it compared to Lake Placid? Lake Placid, there's more there's more gator uh, uh, footage than there is in this. Where like it's all like practical effects of like a gator in a pool opening its teeth when somebody jumps into right, it, or right, right. like shots of like somebody being dragged in the sewers and stuff like that. So it's it's the less is more kind of thing because they didn't have the more to work with. Um, but it has its charms. It's just it's just a very deliberately paced movie for the time because it does feel like it's trying to take the police procedural of this one guy investigating these series of grisly murders and then sort of fuse it with the creature feature genre where the creature feature stuff kind of is more in the last act of the movie and then they did a sequel which is also coming out uh through screen factory called alligator 2 the mutation which is only really a, a sequel in title and has uh d wallace uh who is probably best known as the mom in et and was in in the mom and critters as well um and was also a, a lead in the howling um joe dante's movie but yeah it's alligator is just one of those weird kind of peculiar kind of movies that like again like it's it's the sum of its parts um but if you're looking for like a fun double bill with something like lake placid or crawl um and are just kind of fascinated by the people that worked on it because john sales is another guy who uh has a credit on the script and john sales would be kind of best known as writing movies um that were far from what uh alligator is like eight men out and lone star and things like that so it's funny to see like a a, you know a writer director who's kind of known as like making movies for grown-ups do like this kind of like b movie on the side and um yeah, it's 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 a fun film, not a great movie, but it it's never looked better, and it's just great that it's now finally available on 4K and Blu-ray. And like again, this was a movie that a lot of people wanted Scream to release for the longest time, and now it's available. Sweet, cool. Yeah. Um, I've never seen it, but I do like me an alligator movie, so maybe one day. And you got um, Robert Forster in it, man. I love Can't Robert go wrong. Forster. Um. 
Let's move on to some trailers. So I know we did a big trailer show last week, right? Was that last week's yes, episode? That yeah. was our, our multi trailer madness. Big yeah. game episode. Uh and then of course, right after we finished that, uh a bunch more uh trailers dropped. Uh so we let's talk about a few of them. Um Eric, the Boz Boys. We're the Boz Boys. Everyone knows that <laughs> Matt and Eric, we're the Boz boys, so we got to talk about Boz Lerman's Elvis. So uh, we did get a full trailer uh, starring Austin Butler. and Yes, who is in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood as one of Manson's disciples, okay. Tex. Yep. Now I know where I saw him because I was like, where have I seen this guy before? Uh, and uh, Tom Hanks in a fat suit. Um, so this movie basically takes place in the Cloud Atlas universe. Yes, uh, it does look like a character he would have played in Cloud Atlas. Because um, he's playing the colonel who is basically his manager and kind of ripped him off. And mm-hmm. um, so, like, I was kind of, I think that was the most curiosity kind of going in before seeing the trailer. He was supposed to be like, like the Tom- villain, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and then watching the trailer, it's like, oh, yeah, it's a Baz Luhrmann movie. Yeah, and... Uh, Love him or hate him. I know, you know, he's a very uh, acquired taste, I will say. Um, I don't even hate Boz Lerman. Like, I almost appreciate him <clears throat> for, um, you know, committing to his vision in all his of his style. movies. His style. Like, he, you know, he doubles down on it and there's no one making, you know, movies quite like his. Um, and some of them I vibe with, some I don't. I mean, I'll go into each one and go, okay, I'll give it a shot. Like, it is, they're very loud. They're very, uh, in your face. Um, there are lots, lots of confetti. Yeah. I'm sure. Like and there's a lot of PAs cleaning up. I confetti usually after have the day. a headache afterwards. And I don't mean that as an insult either. Cause like I can like a movie and it can give me a headache. Like sometimes a, an assault on your senses is kind of fun. Um, so yeah, I, you know, I have a soft spot for Romeo and Juliet. Cause like when I was younger, I remember that being like the one, version of Romeo and Juliet I I saw quite a bit and it and when you're younger going like oh, this is weird they have guns and you know it's very 90s and but like, they're calling them swords uh, still yeah <laughs> and like I remember when I was younger that being like one of the, the people who used to the girl who used to babysit me like she loved because it was Leo DiCaprio it, you know people being obsessed in his with teen him. idol yeah. phase yeah. so she was obsessed with him so I remember watching Romeo and Juliet like at a at a young age and um, yeah, I, you know, he's hit or miss for me. Like I, I can't say maybe any of his movies I've really truly loved, but, um, I can vibe with some more than others. Like I don't hate great Gatsby. Um, I'm Australia to, uh, is oh, so no, boring. I can't, I can't do Australia. I can't do it. I remember it's when so I worked bad. at Cineplex and, and that, and it being like three hours long and just being like, I, I can't. and it is boring. Yeah. Like it's not even like like deliberately paced like it is truly a slog to get through and it's so self-indulgent and i think that's part of why like i was kind of like even with going into the great gatsby self-indulgent is a good way of describing him but i mean a lot of filmmakers are are, but 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 again like if you're into that style and aesthetic that he's bringing to the films like we talked about this at the beginning he hasn't done that much eh with with um uh with with jackass you know like i don't like moulin rouge either like yeah. like that's i've tried to get through moulin rouge and i'm like i just I, one of these days like i will <laughs> but i yeah. i think i'll give it a fair shot but it's just again not it's a lot like i'm in like the first 20 mi- minutes i remember smoking a joint and trying to watch moulin rouge and i was like i can't deal with this right now i just can't <laughs> do it i'm like this is too much and i had to shut it off but i know and i think the Oh, I was just going to say, and I think the other thing that's going against this movie, if you're not a fan of Elvis or Elvis's music, that's another thing that is kind of like, all right, like, am I going to be able to get past that if it's an interesting enough story? So, yeah, it's been almost 10 years since Gatsby, and then he doesn't like work that frequently, eh? but he's he is one of those guys that I feel like even if you don't know him by name, I feel like you go, okay, yeah, you can really you know his style (laughs) like if you if you've seen another one of his movies so yeah australia i remember just being so boring and then um (laughs) uh, and i don't hate great gatsby or romeo and juliet and then moulin ruse i've tried to watch uh, a few times and strictly ballroom i don't know if i've ever seen 
that that's his first feature and that one is it's okay it's it's more modest in comparison to where he's gone career-wise the the bigger the more flamboyant the more over the top the kind of you know the decadence of of you know a lot of gold a lot of yeah hyper paced world building and like modern music and time settings that aren't supposed to have it <laughs> it drives me nuts. I can uh, do like, it I, sometimes. I don't mind it, but like, yeah. I don't. I guess. I. I mean, like again, I, I'll probably sound like a contrarian, or or like there's always, a, you know, uh, what, what's what's the saying? The, 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 there's always an example to the rule, or like there's always oh totally. I mean, was watching rule. Euphoria the other night, last night actually, and um, I was watching a bit of it, and I'm like, a lot of this stuff on paper are the classic Matt things that I like. But when I saw it in euphoria, I'm like, this is obnoxious, but like, in so when you like something, you like something. And when you and don't, you've got you the, don't, the taint of assassination like, nation. Yeah. And I think that's why, right. And why I don't like, um, uh, Sam, Sam Levinson. Levinson. So when I see overture come on the screen and there's like a two minute segment of just an overture, a musical overture, I would eat that shit up in, um, What's a Tarantino movie, a Tarantino movie, or who's the da- guy who did Vox Lux, which I know a lot of people. Um, oh, uh, 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 Bradley uh, Colbert. Yeah, yeah, Colbert. Uh, Col- yeah, and uh, I love it in his shit, but people might think it's obnoxious in his shit. Um, but when I saw it in in Euphoria last night, and I don't really watch Euphoria, but I didn't like Sam Levinson because of Assassination Nation. I was like, oh god, it's so obnoxious, <laughs> and I'm like, so um, get over yourself. You know, which I I'm sure if I actually gave Euphoria a shot, I might like it. But um, seeing it out of context and and because I hated Assassination Nation, sorry Eric, but I it's the same thing. No, with no, no, Boz I... Lerman. It's like when you see those things that he does, you might go, oh. But if someone else does it, you're like, oh, this works. But yeah, it just depends. so it's 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 yeah, it's just it's really preference, if anything else. You know, you can be the Levinson lads or you can be the Boz boys. It's up to you. <laughs> yeah. But anyways, Elvis didn't do much for me. Um no. I've never been an Elvis guy either. So like Shot in Australia um, though, which is kind of And is it a it's a musical, right? Or is it I think it's I think it's a musical in the same way that Moulin Rouge or Gatsby is, where right. it is incorporating, you know, a lot of the music of both not only Elvis, but like that's the that is the one kind of interesting thing and and, and even though Walk the Line is not a good movie either, but it kind of got the point across in that film where, you know, you had people like Johnny Cash, Roy Orbison, Elvis, all kind of coming up at around the same time and like what that meant. And and that will be something that I'm sure is also going to be debated. And it's even in the trailer a little bit is that Elvis, you know, directly took influence from African-American artists and the gospel and repurposed it as his own and kind of got rich off of it without really giving credit where credit's due. Yeah. So that's a whole other conversation and can of worms that I think is going to be um, front and center when the movie comes out and, and has always been um, a talking point because um, in, in the late or in the seventies, when, when um, Elvis kind of became chummy with R- Richard Nixon, there were rumors that Elvis said some pretty derogatory things um about african-american culture yeah like, and, so will they touch that at all yeah <clears throat> which they know. probably won't no yeah uh, a trailer i do really want to talk about is chippendale rescue rangers because <laughs> eric i did not expect to be as into this trailer as i am um i it totally caught me off guard i know when they announced that um the lonely island uh akiva uh was directing it that I'm like, okay, Andy Samberg, John Mulaney, like, uh, I'm like, that sounds weird and interesting. Directed by the guy who directed Hot Rod. I'm like, okay, this sound, I'm I'm kind of in. And then I see this weird Roger Rabbit meta kind of take on Chip and Dale. Um, and I was completely kind of like, holy fuck, this looks awesome. I think this looks great. And I know we're at a point where the self-referential kind of meta stuff is almost getting uh you know legacy sequel reboot scream touched on it many other things are um but i just i i just love the sense of humor that those guys have and the irreverent kind of take on it and um uh i just continuously laughed and have watched this trailer like four or five times i had to show it to nevis and i'm like nevis you're not it's I know if even if you don't care about Chippendale, like I got to show you this trailer because it, it it will be completely different than what you expect it. And um, I just thought the jokes hit um, the mix of animation, live action 
and CGI animation. Like I don't think we've ever seen a movie that had a CGI character and a 2d animated character in a real world setting, like going about things. And just this, the line about the CGI ser- surgery is so funny. And then like the use of all the different animated characters, like in Roger rabbit and stuff and Roger rabbits in the trailer, uh, I was not expecting at all where you're kind of having this commentary on different animation styles and uh, we'll get into that. But did you did you this do anything for you or what? I gotta admit something. I didn't watch the trailer. You haven't yet? <laughs> no. No, Eric, you gotta, dude. Like I, I will, I will, and I'll talk about it next time. That's I, the, fine. I mean, thing, I, I might stop it and make you watch it right now. The thing not that I was against it, because I grew up watching the show. I love the yeah. opening title credits. You know, yeah. Do they use um, all that? Yeah. But it was I. I wasn't sure if it was. I mean, after talking to you, sure. was a series or a movie? It's a movie because I remember when it was in, initially announced, they were planning to do like a series. Like I think they were a reboot they were, series. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Maybe before um, the Lonely Island guys were attached, but I know when they announced this at Disney Plus Day, it was a Disney Plus original. Um, original movie but yeah i don't want to spoil it though eric because like i really do think that you should watch the trailer because it, it I will. is i will i think you will genuinely like uh, vibe with it because it, it is that same kind of mix of really stupid humor but also that kind of meta commentary on animation and just you know legacy sequels and reboots and um I, again like i said i know that that's been happening a lot lately but i just feel like it's such a weird take to do a chip and dale um reboot series that um i i just was totally unexpected for me and um i thought it looked awesome and it's made me go back and and turn on chip and dale rescue rangers on disney plus and i'm like man i haven't watched this in ages but um no man it, it like roger rabbit's in the trailer and you can see uh, like paula abdul and um and that mc and, scat cat yeah is in it and like oh my god this <laughs> dude and like i don't want to spoil it but like there's so many mc scat cat. yeah and like oh it's god. just i almost want to make you watch it right now but like oh um, man um pull it up yeah, i did i didn't i didn't i didn't watch it because of um I, yeah, I just thought it was like a series. Pull it up and... on your phone or something, because like I'll just I'll talk as you watch it, or you can kind of commentate over it. We're gonna have Eric react to the Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers movie trailer. And right if there's now. a Tailspin and, reference in there, I'm um, gonna lose my mind. I just you can play it, and we can kind of hear it in the background, and and we'll just watch. Everyone, pause or not pause, just pull it up right now. We're gonna watch Chip and Dale, the trailer with Eric as a kill time. But like I. I was like, I was not expecting this, and I think it's perfect, and everyone should watch Hot Rod. Gary's watching it. This is great podcast content. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm in. Yeah, absolutely. I love the cats riff at the end. I think. Oh, the, that is good. The, the Seth Rogen thing. Ha- I reminded me, like, even though Roger Rabbit's in the trailer, that it's kind of like a Zemeckis jab. I kind of took that as. I don't. I know he's more of like a troll kind of character, but like that animation style that like kind of looks realistic, the early motion like, capture. Yeah, right? like sort of looks realistic, but is kind of like that uncanny. Like they're not looking in the right area, and there's something wrong in their eyes. Like I thought that was really funny, and like all the cameo from other animated characters and. And, and things like that you saw scrooge mcduck in there um people were looking at that shot of the with the jurassic park reference that it was like the head of an aristocat um and like one of the arms was like um looked like wreck it ralph's arm and its body was the animated robin hood and like so it just looks like it's going to play on all these different animated franchises and kind of do the lego movie style thing or um that kind of that stuff and i i think it just it looks really really funny and um just a completely different route than i was expecting them to take <laughs> yeah it looks 10 times better than um tom and jerry from last year and that's which... what i mean tom and jerry or like that's what you expect is a tom and jerry or a um alvin and the chipmunks kind of thing and even how um uh, Dale is animated looks like the Alvin and the chipmunks right with his CGI surgery which I think is a really funny line and um, yeah Scrooge McDuck you see the three little p- pigs and MC scat cat in the um, that's so good which is really really funny because so. I saw that I saw images of of Paul Abdul and MC mm-hmm. scat cat but I thought it was like for like a Super Bowl ad no it, it was in Chip and Dale rescue Rangers. which is amazing a that D-H truly is a Paul Abdul that is truly like a uh, uh, Lonely Island kind of like, it's like, okay, Absolutely. well, we got to do this. Um, and like that s- scene of like the guys with like the machine guns coming down and stuff like that. And I'm like, I'm just not expecting that. Um, shot by uh, Larry Fong, who uh, recently did the Tomorrow War and the Predator and Kong Skull Island and Batman v Superman. Um I just think it looks it looks wild and, and a lot of fun. So it's coming out May twentieth on Disney Plus, a movie that I would have liked to see in theaters, but you know it's okay. It yeah. does make sense that it's on uh, Disney Plus. It's great corporate synergy. So <laughs> after you finish yeah. watching the movie, you can go back and watch all the references that mm-hmm. it's it's pertaining to. But it is it is funny to think though, like late eighties, early nineties kid cartoons had some of the best opening theme songs, some of the most catchy theme songs, whether it be yeah. jungle book, tailspin, chip and Dale, um, like, uh, uh duck tales. Like yeah. all of those are amazing. Woo-hoo. Um, I didn't watch the trailer. There's a couple more things that dropped this week. Uh, we got a trailer for the contractor windfall. Uh, I did watch the hustle, uh, teaser trailer and the studio 666 trailer which is the foo fighters horror movie it was awful. oh yeah yeah was that awful. does look bad it, was it looks like um there was this show that was on comedy the comedy network um taught in the book of evil it kind of almost yes. looks like that basically uh, the foo fighters uh studio 666 is that tucker and dale is that that one that you're talking about no, no 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 uh todd versus the book of evil is oh, like this okay it's this kind of like Canadian low budget. It kind of is in the same realm as Tucker and Dale, but Tucker and Dale like has a point where it's almost like <laughs> this joke that these two guys aren't serial murderers, but every time they're in a situation with somebody, they become kind of like the fall guys. Uh, where Todd in the book of evil is like this really bad, like sort of like high school kind of, you know, on the precipice of evil kind of thing. And like a lot of the special effects are really tacky and what have you. Um, windfall i did watch uh the trailer for which is the new film from charlie mcdowell who directed um i can't remember the name of it now i'm I'm blanking on it but basically what windfall looks like is it's the one with uh, elizabeth moss which i didn't really care for um it's like you're the one or something like that um but with Windfall, it kind of almost looks like uh, The Ref, that movie with Dennis Leary and Kevin Spacey um, from the early 90s, directed by uh, Ted Demi. And basically, you have a couple that are um, uh, at the mercy of this uh, robber who's trying to, you know, take whatever he can from the house, but finds out that, you know, they're coming to their vacationing home and kind of this dynamic between the three leads played by Jason Siegel, uh, 
um, Lily Collins and uh, newly uh, Academy Award nominated Jesse mm-hmm. Plemons. So yeah, uh, yeah, I missed out on that. And then um, <clears throat> yeah, Contractor. I didn't watch. Fresh. I didn't either. And it's interesting that Contractor is the film that brings back both Ben Foster and and Chris Pine um after and, hell uh hell or high water yeah and this is like gonna be a vod movie so. yeah it, that's why i don't even think it was on my radar um what else okay moving on to some news um I don't well know paramount had a lot of uh, announcements mm-hmm. including a new star right. trek movie so. yeah paramount had their like investors day yeah uh, kind of thing right where they did confirm that the original cast of the star trek reboot series is in talks to come back which i know they were working on for quite some time because that's gone through a hell of a lot of people right like there was the obviously the tarantino version there was the what's his name uh noah howley Howley, and now i forget who's even attached because there's been so many people i think it's like either sarah clarkson or someone like that but yeah then there was like there was that one pitch and I don't know if it's going to be the same where they were going to bring Chris Hemsworth back and it was going to be kind of like about like sort of focused on the fathers, like father. Yeah. That's originally, but they couldn't get everyone on board, right? Scheduling wise. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and I know the cast was trying to fight for, I think maybe some raises or things like that, but it's good to like, I like that cast. I like the reboot series. Like I think beyond, um, wasn't, Beyond didn't feel like a yeah, finale. No, it didn't. And I feel like they deserve maybe one more shot or... Or, or a um, send-off, a yeah, proper send-off. Because Beyond was enjoyable, but I just don't... I, I found it not very memorable. Like, even Into Darkness um, has its issues. And I think the con stuff is obviously, like, should have never been a, a, mystery, a mystery box <laughs> kind of thing. Um, but... You know, I felt like it's still a little bit more impactful than Beyond or, or felt more important than Beyond. Um, and I just haven't thought about that movie a lot. I remember seeing it in that fucking surround vision. Barco or? Oh, Barco Escape is when we saw it, but it was like now it's screen X or whatever. Yeah. Um, terrible. Yeah. It, it, I mean, Star Trek Beyond isn't a bad movie. No, it's it totally just kind of feels, it almost feels like the same way that Men in Black 3 didn't necessarily feel like the end of a trilogy. Like it was like, oh, you're watching this and it just kind of feels like another sequel, another edition. It's not necessarily the end of this sort of version of, of these movies. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it would be nice to kind of see those characters in this adaptation, get a proper send send off. But it's also interesting that like for a lot of Star Trek fans right now, um, there's a lot of people that aren't a big fan of kind of the darker tone that a lot of these kind of reboot series have kind of gone down with Picard and sort of Star Trek Discovery and stuff like that, where it's like Star Trek was never the... like action focused and stuff like no, that. No, like and it... when it was, it was kind of tongue in cheek mm. and almost weirdly swashbuckling at times. And and with you know the Next Generation series, it was all about diplomacy. It was all about kind of like like there were there were fun moments like you know any time that they would interact with when Jean Luc Picard would interact with like Q or something like that, it'd be kind of campy and, and a little bit kind of you know fun but yeah like it was never considered a series that was like necessarily kind of about like you know exploration pieces yeah yeah right the closest Mm. it came to was the wrath of khan when nicholas meyer who directed that film and also directed the undiscovered country um kind of made it almost like a sub like a submarine movie like you know like two ships kind of battling each other and yeah kind of made it a war picture and mm. that kind of was like the first time where it's like oh like you can kind of be playful with it but still retain the essence of what star trek star is. trek is but now with and as much i think jj abrams star trek is great um and i think it's the best film that he's ever made um it it kind of does feel like with that kind of what we've been talking about this whole show, the reboot, the reimagining, the legacy film, you know, even with star Trek has turned it into something. It's maybe necessarily it's not. And maybe that can work for a movie or a new film franchise. But when you're bringing it back to the series, which never was that star Trek was always kind of boring, Yeah, (laughs) which wasn't a bad thing. It was just, no, 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 no. What it, what it was. And like, I think Abrams obviously, I think it's one of the best examples of that, of keeping 
everything canon that came before it but doing that alternate universe kind of thing where it's like well the red matter excuse yeah these are the these are the exact same you know characters but we took them a different route because their history was changed because of this so yes he grows up to be william shatner or whatever and i think great casting for pine and and the whole cast great casting on everyone um but you you could take some liberties of doing something a little bit more modern or different because you are keeping everything that came before it as canon. You're just kind of changing it from a certain time period and kind of a, the alternate universe kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> Uncharted made $52 million um, this past weekend. Dog, 18 mil, more than I would have thought Dog would have made, but people love dogs. so It made its it, it, its budget back. Yeah, I mean, and, good for it. And then Dog 2 coming to a theater near you in three years. Um uh, but Uncharted doing 52 million, I tweeted this today and it's kind of, that's in that area that I think I was talking about with you where it did well, but not too well. Right. Like I, I right. think 52 million and it'll continue to, even with not so great reviews, probably perform totally okay to the point where they will give it an, a, a sequel. And, and I think I, I also read that it's one of the first, movies this year and, and in a while that is also going to be released in china because you know they can only release a certain amount of american films per year in china and that's like such a huge market where it'll probably make a couple hundred million just there um so i think uncharted is going to do well and it'll probably mean that they'll come back and do another one so um i'm open to it like even if this first one didn't completely work like i i really hope again no offense to ruben fleischer but i hope they move on and maybe bring in someone else instead of just bringing him back for a sequel um but knowing they'll probably just bring him back and it'll be i hope they bring back papa john's yeah who will get Um, the sponsorship in the next one yeah i mean 52 million dollars in in a covid era blockbuster is really good it's not good in the sense that the movie probably cost over close to 200 million dollars mm-hmm. to make but in the sense of like a film that's being released in february that is coming out you know off the it, it's 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 kind of riding the the coattails of spider-man um as well and tom holland's yeah, kind of that star power helped. as well so that all really helps and like i do wonder even though i, I i'm dreading seeing the movie i wonder if they had released uh morbius back in january or even in february if it would have done better than being released on april 1st because of this again the spider-man connection and also not having a lot of competition because you look at uncharted uncharted will probably do quite well this weekend coming up and up until the batman is released so Mm -hmm. And then the Batman basically has most of March, March to itself. That's why I looked at March's release calendar for us to see what we would review. And I'm like, oh, everyone just said Batman coming out March 4th. I'm getting the fuck out of March. <laughs> like, Yeah, because like, Turning Red would have been the film that you would think yeah. like, oh, it'd be great co- counter programming for families and stuff like that. And it would do really well. But it, you know, now being released on, on Disney Plus day and date is not going to be... Um, you know, in that kind of competition. And so a lot of the smaller movies that will be released throughout the month of March are not going to even factor into that at all. Yeah. So, you know, the, the Batman, so uncharted will probably do quite well for people that have seen the Batman three or four times or, or have seen uncharted a few times. And maybe both of them will kind of be like, Oh, I'll make it a movie day and see both films at the theater or the one that I haven't seen. Mm -hmm. So uncharted will probably do well, over the course of March as well as being something that's not Batman. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, there is a, speaking of untitled, haha, an untitled star Wars series um, that's rumored to be trying to get John Watts to direct an episode. And it might have something to do with the high Republic. And if you don't know what the high Republic is, it's kind of an interconnected um narrative that they've been doing more on the publishing side of star wars so there's like a series of both uh novels for adults for children there's comic book series and all this kind of stuff i have a couple of the novels i just haven't started them because it sounded like an interesting thing to get into um high republic being you know the time where the jedis were all over the place in the galaxy and and um 
you know, way before the prequels and things like that. Um, Yoda, because he's so old, I think is part of it and, and, and different things like that. But um, <laughs> it sounded like almost like a diss. No, Yoda's just an old <laughs> motherfucker, man. So, um, so old. He was even a part of the High Republic. It, yeah, I, that's true. I think I might be wrong, but um, Yoda, you're old as balls. <laughs> and uh, Yaddle there somewhere. Um, oh. I, hope, they, I hope Grogu's parents are Yoda and Yaddle. <laughs> oh, that'd be good. Um, cause uh, Yoda getting his fuck on is weird to think about, but, um, I was going to make a joke, but I'm not even going to, um, <laughs> it's supposed to be geared to a younger audience too. So like it, it should be interesting cause star Wars is always sort of geared towards kid kids, but obviously has some more mature themes in a lot of it. So it'd be interesting, like how they'll differentiate, you know, if Mandalorian and Boba Fett are their more adult series, like what a series for younger people, because essentially you're trying to hit all, I think, age groups with that kind of stuff. So if you make something more specifically geared towards children, uh, I guess you got to really make that clear. Um, yeah. So I'm curious. Obviously, John Watts is uh, after Spider-Man. He'll be very sought out for for things and especially well, no, he was picked Disney. for this because of cop car yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah absolutely i i'm sure you know stay in the disney family too they're gonna start you know well he's why. doing fantastic four right yeah so. and and taika i mean i know spider-man was sony but then they you know yeah after that spider-man trilogy brought him over to do fantastic four and you can see with taika waititi still supposed to be doing a star wars movie and, and if that's happening still but um, the Star Wars universe always interesting to see what they'll what it's actually in, will come out. <laughs> it's in flux right now, mm. but I gotta say this, Matt. I actually really liked the book of Boba. Fett. Oh, I know. Yeah, we didn't really talk about it because I was kind of. Uh, I'm not like down on it. I again, okay. I liked like, it more than we, Rise of Skywalker. I'll give it that. Like, oof. I'll even say that. Oh, I mean, you're not Rise of Skywalker. Is I gotta like rewatch a it wet again. Noodle. Like, I'm one of those people who you're, you're a defender. Yeah, but like not like a strong. Like I'm not gonna go to like I'm not gonna put my life on the line. Now are you for Daredevil it, like, or are you Jessica um, Jones yeah. as a defender? Um, I'm Ray Skywalker. Um, I I like the sequel trilogy. I'm one of those people that kind of just like Star Wars for the most part, and I, even Book of Boba Fett, which I'm gonna sound more negative on. I'm like I don't hate it. And the sequel series, I'll be very curious. I, I'm I'm itching for a complete Star Wars rewatch because I haven't done that probably until leading up to Rise of Skywalker. So now, a few years removed from Rise of Skywalker, I would love to go back and rewatch everything, prequels included. Um, and with Rise of Skywalker and the whole Skywalker saga to see how I feel. Because I did soften on that movie. I think I, I liked it when I saw it. <clears throat> I was one of those people that liked Force Awakens a lot. I liked Last Jedi a lot. And I liked Rise of Skywalker a lot. That's not a lot of people. <laughs> um, I mean, there is a lot of people who just Two out something. of three ain't um, bad. I know you. Yeah. And I, I Last that. Jedi slaps. Oh, I don't so care good. what anybody it's, says. It's that great. movie is the best of the new films. And I like The and Force all Awakens. Of them I think The Force Awakens their is a great, great uh, greatest hits movie. Yes. A a agreed. Um, so anyways, back to book of Bo Boba Fett, which the emperor happen. has returned. It's the worst. And I, and I, <laughs> even for me who didn't mind that movie when I first saw it, that is still awful. I remember going in and being like, Oh no. Could you imagine Oscar like, Isaac? Who's an amazing actor being like, really? That's, say that's this? how we're going to do that. That's, that's <laughs> what we're going to do. Or that's how he's going to come back. That's what we're going to do. Are you the guys sure? Has Are you guys sure? Are you guys sure? <laughs> That's how you want. It'd be like in 10 MCU movies from now, you have Moon Knight go, Thanos has returned. And like, oh, no, no could explanation. Could you imagine if Oscar like, Isaac got that, that, do that, that? <laughs> that page on the script that day? And he's like, oh, fuck you guys. <laughs> like, it's just, there was no build up to it. There's not, that movie is very messy. So I'm very, I'm very I, curious. You can tell that they just had, they didn't know what to do. And, no. And, and it's hard to, Especially when you have that added pressure of it being the final in a nine film, you know, series that is supposed to basically kind of like sum everything up, wrap it all up. And the direction that they were going to go in, I think, was a little bit different. And and, and 
as much as JJ did what he could, I don't think the enthusiasm was there for what he was doing as a director that compared to what he was doing with the force awakens. Oh yeah, totally. And, and like, even the way that, you know, the spinoffs kind of fumbled quite a bit when it came to like how the, the planning of, of that was going to be. And now a lot of the, the spinoffs presumably have become, you know, series, you know, like they're, and I think that that actually works. I think if you're going to continue you know, doing this for, for the time being, why not, um, expand them into series? And like, I'm actually really excited for Obi-Wan and I oh, would same. not have yeah. thought that to go back you know, to that few years yeah, ago, the prequel era sort of thing. You have, you know, Anakin coming back and, and whether it's flashbacks and him playing Vader and Watto, um, maybe God, I hope so. But like even going back to those prequel characters or things you wouldn't have expected, but even seeing the Nabu starfighter in book of Boba Fett was a huge pop. That's going, wizard going back to the, the pod racing <laughs> uh, track and stuff like that. Right. Like um, I, I think there's a lot to enjoy in book of Boba Fett. I thought it was a not so great Boba Fett show um, with two good episodes of the Mandalorian. And the thing is, I just, if you're going to focus it on Boba Fett, I, I wish you didn't have those two episodes of the Mandalorian, even though I really like them. I just felt like they were just set up for season three. And I understand that this is a spinoff of Mandalorian, even though it's a legacy character from the original C, uh, the original trilogy. Uh, I was never a Boba Fett guy. I think some of it works. I think a lot of it doesn't. I think him being out of his helmet for as much as he he was. Uh, I like uh, Tamora Morris uh, Tamora Morrison, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, a lot. But I just I just felt like man, they needed to, that character. And maybe I'm just going what I wanted the character to be, but like, and not what they gave me, but uh, I was never a huge Boba Fett guy, but I just felt like uh, he was too nice throughout the whole thing. And like, I never bought into him wanting to take this, uh, you know, Jabba's throne. Uh, I felt like they spent a lot of time on some of those flashbacks that, you know, I kind of already understood what he went through before he came back in, in, mando and i didn't really need that spoon fed to me and i just felt like none of it was all that interesting and then even they felt like it was not that interesting because they just leave him for two and a half episodes before you come back to him in in the finale and i just felt the villains weren't very interesting they never really built up the pikes to be that cool and i don't know man like it just i didn't hate it but i wasn't like oh shit this was great now if the show is called like star wars adventures or something like that and it just had like an ensemble cast throughout the star wars universe and like boba fett was one of the main characters so maybe i'm just like focusing too much that it was called the book of boba fett and it was supposed to be his story that maybe i'd be a little bit more forgiving and maybe you spread it out a little bit more so maybe mando shows up ahsoka luke skywalker's there all all this kind of stuff and even if you look at the poster of book of boba fett i would have been like the fuck is this show when they started like putting luke skywalker and ahsoka and baby yoda and mando and and all these people on there that I just found it really rough and like, it's not that I didn't like it. I just, um, I think there's two separate things in there and I feel like it could have been a little bit more cohesive and, and tighter. Uh, anyways, but you liked it. Yeah. I, I, I understand what you're saying, but at the same time, it's like Boba Fett in the original, uh, you know, trilogy of films was a character that appeared on screen for what, like maybe, five minutes max yeah. and i think that they do what's necessary with the character and with the world building you know from his perspective post return of the jedi in a way that feels like they gave him enough of a character sketch without going too far to like be like oh he's just as important as han solo or luke skywalker or, or any of the other kind of stuff in the world and i think why i am a little bit of a sucker for all of this is that a lot of it does take place on tatooine and a lot of it is sort of focused on you know this guy coming in to become sort of 
you know, the new ruler and sort of what goes into the minutia of, you know, basically taking over the role of what Jabba was, but doing it in a way that isn't what who Jabba was as, as a cruel and unusual kind of villain and, and the rebirth of Boba Fett from the Sarlacc pit into kind of creating a character that maybe is more considerate and just, especially having been, you know, taken in by the sand people and the Tuscan Raiders and, and trained by them and kind of seeing a new perspective on things. And some of the film references with the train that I really loved and, and those little moments I think go a long way. Yeah. The narrative, the storytelling is very clunky with the Bantha tank and like him dreaming, but I love the look of the Bantha tank. And like, I loved, you know, the, the production design of it and just kind of like, the idea of going from the dream back into the reality and then kind of like, you know, him going back to places that are familiar, even when he goes back to the pit and the reference with the, the, the seismic charge, I think is really well done. And then, um, you know, to your point, I think that there are other characters within this series that are more memorable. Obviously, you know, Mando is, is, you know, they're doing a lot of work there to not, have to like go back to part two to remind you of they what's wanted going on him when in they a certain to... spot in part three yeah so. yeah so when you get to the mandalorian season three they don't have to kind of you know do all this extra work to get to where they are they're already there i think that that actually weirdly works is almost like a backdoor pilot oh to totally season three um but don't those two episodes I love, rip they're great i love that this show is going back to what star Wars was. Mm -hmm. It was influenced by spaghetti Westerns. It was influenced by samurai movies. I love, love, love Cad Bane. Yeah. He's Cad dope. Bane. You should go rocks. back and watch more, uh, like find the episodes that he's in, in clone wars and rebels. Cause he's even, he's even sillier in the animated series in like a good way. Like he's just got this, like, uh, anyways, I love Cad Bane too. This is, this is the first star Wars character in a very, very long time that not only made an impression on me, I was actually kind of afraid of him. Yeah. He's like when you see and, and his yeah. voice, like the deliberate, it's a same voice. actor. I want the series too, more so. Cad. Bane. <laughs> give me the book of Cad Bane. I wouldn't be surprised if people really like that character, if they go back and give you more. Cause he has such like a, a long history and we have seen a lot of it in the animated stuff, but um, and I liked his stuff with Boba Fett, like even though there's yes. not a lot of it, but there, then that, that's there's part still of stuff there. Totally. And there's a history there, but like, and I feel like, hardcore fans will get a lot out of that. I just find that if you maybe aren't as hardcore and you're just watching this, I feel like you can be a little bit maybe like, Oh, and then like, you, cause I don't want to spoil anything, but like, again, I, I feel like you're like, Oh shit, I guess maybe they have a history and then it's just kind of done with. And then you're like, oh, okay. Um, I don't feel like that payoff was as, I, I really love the character. I love that they're bringing in animated characters in the live action, like with Ahsoka in, in Mando season two and Cad Bane here. And like, I, I really do think that stuff is awesome. And I think his look is great. His voice is great. They really, you know, I, it's a character you wouldn't think would work. Cause it is a bit silly. Like this space cowboy blue face, like ridiculous hat, like full on Western, like got the, the revolver kind of thing. But um, oh, Cad Bane just, fucks. Yeah, he's awesome. He's he's super dope. Yeah. So again, don't get me wrong. Uh, I see where you're coming from. I know a lot of people dug the series. Um, I just uh, unfortunately uh, didn't work for me because I guess like Mando, I really like both those seasons of Mando. And then maybe I'm like, oh, there's already a cooler version of Boba Fett and I've gotten two, two seasons of him. And then now you came in and he came in here. I'm like, I'm way more interested in this guy than I am this guy. And that kind of lost me, even though I really loved those two episodes. It just, it really hammered home how much I didn't care about those first four episodes. Um, Cause I was like, I, uh, sure. But I do like what you're saying where it did feel like old school star Wars with some of the creature work and the puppet work and like the location. The the, like, yeah. I, I do like some of that stuff and I watched the whole thing and I'm not 
angry at watching the whole thing. I just didn't find myself as interested. And then it did make me excited for Mando season three. Now, my question to you, Eric, do you think we get another season of Boba Fett or is he just going to be a part of Mando moving forward? Well, I think he'll he'll definitely be in, in season three of Mando somewhere. Um, I I wouldn't be surprised if they try to do another season of the book of, of Boba Fett because of Pedro Pascal's schedule where like you might have this opportunity now to but now i think maybe because we've seen that first season of the book of boba fett and it's not necessarily all about boba fett maybe those expectations moving forward will kind of be a little bit more um forgiving of of like okay maybe it's going to explore aspects of boba fett but it's also going to bring in other characters as well and like even seeing people like steven root show up yeah you know in, in one episode is is kind of delightful and and, and funny and um i like yeah. all the casting that favreau and and feloni and robert rodriguez in here feloni's no baloney like even seeing danny trejo show up as the rancor, as a rancor tra- trainer, trainer is awesome it's amazing like, it's great because it's not something i'd ex- i would have expected and then sophie thatcher who's in yep. both um the book of boba fett and and yellow jackets is playing one of the 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 mod um uh, bikers like yeah there's like there's a lot of there's a lot of fun stuff in here that kind of reminded me of why i loved it so much as a kid but i do agree with you though as well where like even though i like boba fett i do think mando is a better character mm-hmm. because mando even in that first season when we were introduced to him there was more time to develop him and he wasn't based on something that was already pre-existing right so you could take a character you know from scratch and kind of mold him in a way that, you know, works for the tone of his yeah. show where book of Boba Fett, like tonally speaking, there are times where it is very childlike. And then there are other moments where it is very dark and you're kind of like thinking to yourself, okay, like, is this really for younger kids? Because there is a lot of goofy kind of like slapsticky stuff. That's kind of fun when, you know, the, the Raiders take uh, Boba Fett under uh, their wing and kind of train him and like, you know, him hanging out with the kids. But then like there's stuff that kind of goes really, really dark with the pikes. And, and I, I weirdly thought about like your dad as well. Like would he fish for, for these, for these pikes in this universe? <laughs> um, <laughs> that'd be amazing. It's like he, your dad's the one that solves uh, the yeah, problem there. Dad's but ice fishing right now, actually for, <laughs> for the pikes. Um, but like, yeah, like it's just like tonally. Sometimes I do question star Wars where it's like, I think it is always made for all audiences, but there are some stuff where it is like, you can tell like, you know, kids do like Jar Jar Binks or, you oh, know, the totally. adults really like And I think that's why it's so divisive. Characters. Like, that's why right. I think it's so divisive a lot of the times, too, because, like, it is... Especially now, to, yeah. like, being a Star Wars fan, like... Is a bit exhausting? I, it's it's exhausting, but it's also, like, I hate... Like, I love Star Wars, and I would consider myself a Star Wars fan, but, like, it comes with this, like... <sighs> this smudge this toxic because kind of, of yeah the, of everything that's mm-hmm. gone on in the last 20 odd years where there's this self-entitlement there's this kind of misogyny um mm-hmm. racism that all underlines it which star wars itself is none of that yeah I it's know. what the fans have brought to it and not all fans everyone has to remember it's just fucking tv and movies like it doesn't mean that much like just and it's not yours again you don't own it i didn't love book of boba fett i liked some stuff of it i don't care like it's just like i'll watch the next thing if it doesn't work for you it doesn't work for you i think people just need to chill the fuck out and i mean that's it's a longer conversation and that goes to every fandom um toxic fandom i think is the weirdest thing like who cares there's so many things that I love and if they don't do something that I that I really didn't like or betrays the characters or whatever the fuck one it's your opinion it's not fact two who cares just move on either watch the next thing see if that works for you or stop watching it like you don't it, they don't owe you anything like yeah you're the no. one if you don't like something the the best thing you can do is not give them your money <laughs> Like if you don't like it, like complaining and all this shit just makes you look awful and like in, entitled and like, it's just so stupid because it doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things. If you don't like something, do not pay them for it. And if you don't like it, stop watching it. 
will find something else that you do like it's that and, simple and none of these creators are personally attacking you or your childhood like this isn't some sort of like revenge or something like that or to tarnish what you grew up with and loved you yeah. can still love all of that stuff and they're not assaulting you in any way they're just if anything they liked it as much contents. as you did and they're just trying yeah. to make something new uh last couple of things uh sticking with star wars just quickly nicholas Bertel is doing the score for andor which is awesome if you guys don't know nicholas Bertel, he's worked uh on uh recently succession probably his biggest Barry jenkins thing. Barry jenkins stuff uh cruella he did the score cruella just nominated for don't look up as well uh, a fantastic composer, and I'm always interested in hearing new composers tackle Star Wars music. Uh, the other piece is John Williams is coming back to do the theme for Obi-Wan Kenobi, uh, which is the same thing he did for Solo. So he's not doing the entire score, uh, but he will do the theme. So the theme music for Obi-Wan Kenobi uh, will be done. And your by fellow birthday John boy. Williams. Yeah. And then uh, finally, I'll end it on uh, Stranger Things. We got some big news uh, from that, Eric. I know you're not the biggest fan of the series, um, but we are getting the fourth season uh, at the end of May, but it's being split up into two seasons, so or two separate oh. halves. So they're doing... They're, they're pulling this now, where like some series, like it's like part one of two. Yeah. I actually think it's smart because of netflix's release model like i bet you they could have maybe released it all but i know it's probably special effects heavy as well um yeah. but they are doing the first five episodes and then the last four episodes i believe so part one and part two of season four um which i think is probably a good idea because of the way people consume netflix content like have people binge the first half of the season have people talk about it for that month and a half until the the second part because then i feel like you're now continuing the discussion for stranger things for longer than that one or two week period that you know after people binge it they talk about netflix shows and then they kind of peter out right so i think maybe the part one part two thing could be smart for some of their event series um uh you know we've seen it in the past breaking bad did this uh i think even lost did this where you take a hiatus in between like the first half and second half of your season or whatever so uh we only have to wait a month and a month and a half or something for the the two parts but uh and then they did announce that season five will be the final season of stranger things so they're doing one more season and then 20 years from now they'll bring everyone back when they're old yep. That's how it works. Revivals. It's going to happen. Oh yeah. Um, but that also might be a reason why they're, they're dividing it into two because they, they have, you know, at least a season and a half to play with for a little bit longer than just kind of dumping it all at once, letting it, you know, be absorbed in one way or another. And they can say, okay, well we have, you know, season four, part two on the way. And, you know, even though season five is our last one, we still have, you know, half of a season to go that people can look forward to. Yeah. And so first part is May 27th uh, with volume two on July 1st. And um, the Duffer brothers did say that like the reasoning behind it is that they had um, it's almost double the length of any other season of Stranger Things. So I don't know what that means, which is like, is every episode going to be like over an, two like, hours or an hour and a half like is someone i forgot who tweeted maybe um i forgot who tweeted this but they're like is every episode going to be feature length and i'm like that's ridiculous but um we'll see i mean i i love stranger things and um i i think it's obviously netflix is like well uh, cobra kai is their best thing but this is their biggest <laughs> thing um so and i pro i'm pretty sure they're probably worried of it ending after five seasons i'm sure they'll do some spin-off or something with some other creator um, or they're they're going to look at one of their other shows like squid games and put a lot more into that yeah. moving forward because yeah it's 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 like when you have you know when hbo had the end of like the sopranos they got a little bit nervous or or like even with game of thrones yeah. you know like i it's still like, don't you, think you, they found it right like euphoria is doing well but very different yeah, I mean, they're um, doing the prequel Game of Thrones series, which is coming up this year. So, and I mean, HBO Max as well, which kind of is their spinoff in, in a lot of ways, has a lot of programming that's kind of right now, like throwing everything at the wall and see what sticks and what will kind of continue. But in terms of like, 
you know, the hour drama, you know, genre tinge stuff. Yeah, like this Netflix obviously, you know, started with House of Cards and, and Orange is the New Black. But I think Stranger Things is the, the show that kind of got more and more people to subscribe than any other. And then Cobra Kai now seems to be getting even more people and and to to watch but yeah i don't i don't dislike stranger things i yeah, think I know it's a very been more, watchable show yeah you've been more medium on it like you you yeah. enjoy it but you're not like all in on it be, because my problem with it is that it doesn't feel like it's doing anything more than being referential to the things that it loves and is not really building on its own foundation not creating anything that isn't that we haven't seen in other movies that it's it's lovingly or series that it's a lovingly reference yeah. and like i again i always do this but i i compare it to something like jeff nichols midnight special where that did something very similar where it took all of those kind of like mid to early 80s um sci-fi horror references and but did it so used them as the bones and kind of fleshed out the story and mm-hmm. characters and world in a way that kind of felt like okay like it 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 went on its own path and i don't I, disagree I never felt stranger things did and especially to like even the casting of certain actors in guest spot roles with Matthew Modine and Sean Ashton and with this season coming up, Robert England, like I'm sure there's going to be a ton of nightmare on Elm Street. Oh, absolutely. Which is like, I'm almost, that's what I expect from stranger things. It's popcorn entertainment for me. I don't think it's like, and I think the characters are great and stuff like that, but um, I don't disagree with anything that you're saying and I totally understand that. And, um, but to me it is that kind of summer, you know, a derivative of eighties, you know, action adventure movies and stuff like that, that I'm like, I'm here for it. It's entertaining and that's all I need it to be. But, um, I'm, I'm pumped. So, and then I think five seasons and ending it is probably end it when you're on top is probably a good thing instead of just driving it into the ground. Um, well, they're getting older too, right? Like that's yeah, the thing. You can only you keep it in the eighties for so long when, you know, yeah. Millie Bobby Brown just turned 18, which is wild because she was like, it seemed like she was 10 years old when this first started. And I'm like, when did the first season of stranger things even air? And then, um, it's been a while though. It's been like seven years, I think. Right. Or, or something like that. Um, since the first season. So, um, it's something that still feels very recent. Um, it's 2016, I think the first season was. Yeah. So, you know, we're six, seven years. Yeah. Since it started, which is why. Yeah. The, so. the main cast is now like all in their 30s. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, dude, we're getting a Stranger Things, you know, reboot or legacy sequel in, you think, 20, 30 years? When are we getting it? I almost feel like they would want to do something in the nineties. So where probably 10 like, years later or something like yeah. the scream route where every 10 years you almost revisit it or something like yeah. that. Yeah. I because be like surprised. the eighties, the eighties specifically means something to the Duffer brothers and Sean Levy, who's a producer and has directed uh, multiple episodes because, well, Sean Levy was, was an actor in the eighties. He's a Canadian. Uh, he's from Montreal and was in a lot of like schlocky, um horror canadian b movies at that time as a, as a teen actor but the duffer brothers like they grew up on this stuff so right it, like it's like okay well what do you do with that nostalgia if you're doing a revival series do you do like yeah. a weird like time you know travel, travel thing, thing or, yeah which you could easily or, do or um yeah yeah i think you're you're probably right because you probably still want a period setting and i'm not saying you know you could set it 20 20 years after and you'd be in the 2000s but i don't think anyone really wants want, but the, like, yeah dude maybe, the duffer brothers like, have nostalgia for the yeah, 2000s yeah. i don't think a lot of people do unless you grew up in oh that and maybe period. in 20 years you bring in someone who does right but yeah. I, I agree with you that maybe they go that 10 years route like where we get in you know the early 2030s jesus christ <laughs> like looking back at uh, the 90s or something like that because i know this is getting into the late 80s but um or yeah, mid we'll to late crotchety and old by then yeah we'll see anyways thanks everyone uh this has been your 116th episode of the untitled movie podcast we hope you enjoyed uh thanks for sticking around another longer episode we're back to our bullshit um so if you're <laughs> Just here like dc if you're here thank you and sorry to anyone who um uh recently we had these weird glitches which we might still have on the video versions um it's something in the back end of after I render a video, 
uh, there's this weird kind of popping or hissing digital noise sound in in the video version, which we were using for the audio version. But now I'm getting behind the scenes, but it should be fixed on the audio side. So you should have a nice clean audio. And then on the video side, I'm still trying to figure shit out. So if you if you go deaf um, because a loud noise i i really do apologize um i'm being facetious i hope no one hurts their ears but it is an annoying sound um and uh, i'm sorry in advance i'm trying to figure it out but um i hope to get that fixed soon or i'll have to use a different editing program so hooray um if you like this we have other shows that we would love for you guys to check out um as we mentioned we do a show called untitled movie reviews uh where we review uh new release films usually on a weekly basis sometimes multiple times per week it's been a little slower uh to start the year we reviewed a lot of uh, movies uh, sorry a lot of streaming tv shows at the beginning of the year so we reviewed peacemaker the after party uh murderville pam and tommy so you guys can check out all those uh, we also have a review up for Scream, uh, Death on the Nile, Uncharted. Um, Papa John's presents um, Uncharted. Yeah, so you guys can go check those out. And as I mentioned, next Monday, the 28th, um, we will have a review for Matt Reeves' The Batman. So uh, that's, Batman. A, yeah, that's a huge one. Can't wait for it. So if you want a one-stop shop for everything, just head over to our letterbox, which is untitled underscore movies you can find kind of everything there all the links to youtube to podcast services and lists different things like that maybe we'll put up our batman rankings uh eric and i batman and robin number one baby uh, <laughs> batman rank yeah <laughs> batman uh, ranks <laughs> um as always my name is matt Rohrbeck. you can find more of my uh work around the internet but mostly at untitledmoviepodcast.com and soon on family feud canada it's almost been a month of me working there already which is wild um so check that out on cbc 7 30 um on weekdays i don't know if or when one of my questions will be on but i will make sure to let you all know uh, and you can follow me on all those social medias at Matt Rohrbeck. And I'm Eric Marchin. You can find more of my video reviews, including Dog, The Cursed, Marry Me, all the films Anything we don't Matt talk about. to watch, you <laughs> Eric will uh, review them. Yes, on rogerstv.com slash cinemascene and on the social medias on EM6211. Until next time. Ch-ch-ch-chip and Dale. Rescue, Rescue Rangers. Rangers.